Welcome everyone to my limited set review for March of the Machine. This set review will focus on limited, mainly draft, but also of course applies to sealed. There's a lot of cards to discuss, so if you don't have time to sit through the entire set review, I've compiled a handy spreadsheet that's available for all my Patreon and Twitch supporters. So that's a pretty handy guide if you just want a quick overview of all the ratings. And of course, these ratings will also be kept up to date since a few of the ratings might change over time as I play the set more. So by having access to the spreadsheet, you'll have the latest ratings at any time. So let's get started. First off, my rating system. Taking a few examples from Phyrexia All Will Be One, starting with the highest possible grade, which is the S tier. And the Eternal Wonder is a perfect example of a ridiculous bomb. These are pretty rare, there's only a handful of S tier cards in every set, and these are often cards that can win you the game even if you're very far behind on board, and they're often pretty difficult for the opponent to interact with as well. Then we have the A tier, these are still the bomb level cards, and that you're ecstatic to first pick. These are also cards that can win the game by themselves, maybe a little bit easier to answer than some of the ridiculous bombs, but still very powerful cards that you're happy to take, and potentially might also move you into a different color if you, let's say, open them in the second pack. And Archfiend, a great example, so is White Sun's Twilight. Sweepers are often very powerful in limited formats as well, since the opponent may not always see them coming, and then they're going to be very far behind all of a sudden. Then we move on to the B tier. These are often the better uncommons. Some of the best commons in each color might also get to the B tier. And these are great playables. I'm still very happy to first pick a B level card. Most packs will have at least one of them. And Volt Charge here being a great example of a removal spell that is quite efficiently costed in red. Then we also have some nice 2 for one cards, like the Hex Gold Hover Wings, a card that provides a bit of value when it enters, and even if the opponent deals with it, you might still have something left over. So 2 for one cards are also often in the B tier. And then we move on to the C plus category. Now most cards will fall either in the C tier or the C plus tier. So an example of a C plus card, a Canker Bloom, just a, an efficiently costed creature that you're happy to have in almost every deck. C plus cards you're almost never gonna cut from your limited decks, whereas in the C tier, as we'll see, these are more filler cards that may or may not end up in your final build as the card quality over time, of course, in limited formats has increased. So nowadays, a lot of the C tier level cards may no longer make your final deck. So Canker Bloom, a nice C+, some more conditional removal spells or slightly more expensive removal spells might also fall in the C+, category. Then we move on to the C tier, these are your filler cards, and as I've said, sometimes they will make your final deck, sometimes they will not. Also depends on, of course, the curve of your deck. If you have enough 2-drops, then you may not need the Slinger anymore, but if you're kind of short on 2-drops, then this might make the cut. Then you've got uh, pump spells as well. A limited deck can only really make room for so many of these effects. So again, don't need to prioritize them during the draft, but you're often happy to have one or two of these, like a Titanic Growth. Then we get to the D tier. These are the weaker cards that you're gonna cut from your deck more often than not, but every now and then, if you're light on playables, you might still include some of them like the Centurion and then some kind of niche cards that are more meant for constructed like a Mind Splice Apparatus will also fall in the D tier, just not enough uh, use cases in Limited. And then the F tier is pretty rare nowadays, there's not a ton of totally unplayable cards for Limited, but the Merton Safe House from Phyrexia being a great example of a card that might have some niche constructed applications, but has a very few redeeming qualities in Limited. So this is my rating system that I will be using going forward. Then it's time to discuss the Limited archetypes for March of the Machine. Of course there are various two-color pairs that you can draft in March of the Machine. Most decks will end up two colors, but there is a little bit of mana fixing, so you may end up splashing for a third color. And in that case, you might deviate from these two-color archetypes, starting with blue-white, which is Knight Tribal. You'll see a few cards with a Knight creature type, and a few cards that also benefit from having a Knight creature in play. Red-white is the backup color. This is a new mechanic that works with plus one plus one counters and giving various ability keywords to your creatures for a turn. Then blue-black has a graveyard matters theme, so it's going to try and fill the graveyard to enable certain abilities. So cards that mill both you and the opponent 
will have uh, a little bit more power in blue-black than black-green is the incubate mechanic. So as we'll see, cards that can generate these Phyrexian tokens that then transform into creatures will find a nice home in black-green. Then red-green functions with a battle mechanic. So this is a brand new card type that uh, we'll see later plenty of examples in every color. But red-green has the highest density of the battle cards and cards that benefit from maybe attacking battles. Next up we've got blue-red, which is Convoke. Traditionally a green-white mechanic, but now we're seeing it mostly in blue and red. So for Convoke to work you need lots of creature tokens. So any card that generates various creatures with one card is going to be slightly better in blue-red. Then next up we've got black-white, which is Phyrexian Tribal. So lots of cards with the Phyrexian creature type, similar to the Knight Tribal. And black-white has the highest density of Phyrexians and cards that care about Phyrexians. Black-red traditionally a sacrifice deck and no different here. We've got a few cards that can sacrifice artifacts or creatures to generate an advantage. Despite only having one Act of Treason at Uncommon, the sacrifice deck can still work quite nicely. And then green-white is the plus one plus one counter matter theme. So we've got a bit of overlap with a backup mechanic in red and white. And then there's a few additional cards, especially in green, that reward you for putting plus one counters on your creatures. And then last but not least, there's blue-green, which is Transformation Matters. Not only do we have creatures that transform, but of course the battles also tend to transform once you can take them down. So blue and green has a lot of that going on. So having discussed the multicolor archetypes, it's time to go over the multicolor cards first, because that will give us a better idea of how the actual color pairs will work out as we start with Invasion of New Phyrexia. So immediately we start with the battle mechanic here. So a brand new card type. The card type is battle and the subtype is siege. All the battles in the set will be sieges. We might see more subtypes in the future, but for now they're all siege cards. So when a battle enters the battlefield, as you can see in the bottom right corner, it will enter with a number of defense counters on it, and the opponent will have to protect the battle. So in this case, Invasion of New Phyrexia, we can cast it for X, White and a Blue, and when it enters the battlefield we create X, 2, 2, White and Blue Knight creature tokens with Vigilance. This is a pretty fancy battle as it's a mythic rare. Some of them are going to be a bit more streamlined, kind of functioning almost like a sorcery when they enter the battlefield. So you can kind of view the battles as a planeswalker that you're trying to attack down that has, uh, instead of loyalty counters, it has defense counters. So you can uh, attack the battles with your various creatures. Punt, of course, gets to block, and any damage that goes through will reduce the number of defense counters on the battles. And you can also potentially point some direct burn spells at the battles to take them out. And then once the battle removes its last defense counter, it will transform, in this case, into Teferi. And the battles can transform into any number of cards. They can be planeswalkers in this case, but often they'll be creatures or sometimes even sorceries or enchantments. So they can transform into all sorts of cards. And in this case, Teferi is a 4 loyalty planeswalker, can plus 2 draw and discard, can minus 2 to pump up all our knights, and then the minus 3 gives us some interaction. So this is obviously one of the more pushed battles and is uh, indeed very powerful if you've got a lot of mana to sink into it. And this will receive an A grade. Next up we've got a 2 mana 2-2 two, two human knight at uncommon. So this is kind of the signpost uncommon of blue-white. And as we've said, blue-white cares about knights, giving other knights we control plus one plus one. So a very nice lord for the deck. And then for a blue and a white we can tap the marshal and then tap another target creature. So also gives us a bit of interaction for larger creatures the opponent might have. So this card is amazing and is one of the better uncommons in the set in my opinion. And I'll give this one an A as well. A cheap way to pump up your whole team if you're in the blue-white knight's archetype. And this is a great card to take early and build your deck around. Next up is Errant and Jada, a 3 mana, 2 3 legendary human angel at rare, has flash and flying, and says you may look at the top card of your library at any time and cast spells with flash or flying from the top of your library. So, a nice source of card advantage potentially. There's not a ton of cards with flash in this set, but of course, there will be quite a few flying creatures, especially in blue white, which has the highest density of flying creatures in the set. Not quite bomb level status but still very powerful and may provide a bit of card advantage. 
Next up is Invasion of Xerex, a 4 mana uncommon battle which starts with 4 defense counters and says when it enters the battlefield return up to 1 target creature to its owner's hand. So it gives us a nice bounce effect and as we'll see bounce spells get a little bit better in this format because of the presence of the incubate mechanic and large Phyrexian tokens that we may be able to bounce with the invasion. So that's quite nice and then if we manage to defeat the battle it transforms into Vertex Paladin, which has power and toughness equal to the number of creatures we control and also has flying. This one gets a B grade as well, just a nice flexible battle. Hopefully you can attack it down with your blue-white flyers and get another large flyer in return. Of course you're always making a choice when attacking the battle since you're giving up damage that could otherwise be redirected to the opponent. So that's going to be an interesting back and forth in this set whether or not you want to defeat the battles or just go for the opponent's life total right away. And that's going to often be the determining factor of a lot of games in Limited. Next up we move on to Blue Black, where we have Halo Forager, 3 mana, 3 1, Fairy Rogue, and uncommon with flying. And when it enters the battlefield we can pay X mana, and when we do we may cast target instant or sorcery card with mana value X from a graveyard without paying its mana cost, and then exile it afterwards. So it can be any graveyard, including the opponents. So the major potential issue you might face with a forager is not having enough mana to both cast a forager and get back a meaningful spell from the graveyard. So maybe much better in the late game once you have more mana available. Nonetheless, still a very powerful card in the right deck, especially in blue-black, where you'll have plenty of ways to mill cards into the graveyard, and then you'll have a wider selection of cards to cast with the Forager, so it gets a B as well. Next up is Invasion of Amonkhet, a 3-mana uncommon battle. Starts with 4 defense counters, and when it enters the battlefield, each player mills 3 cards, and then each opponent discards a card, and we draw a card. And then if it does transform, we get Lazotap Convert a 4-4, saying we may have the Convert enter the battlefield as a copy of any creature card in a graveyard, except it's a 4-4 black zombie in addition to its other types. So we can hopefully copy a powerful creature with some nice keywords, like flying perhaps, and then the Convert gets even better. So this one also seems quite powerful, and I'll give it a B. Next up is Hidatsugu and Kairi, so we'll see a lot of legendary creatures teaming up to form an even more interesting card. This one a 5 mana 5-4 five, legendary ogre demon dragonet rare with flying, and when it enters the battlefield draw 3 cards and then put 2 cards from your hand on top of your library in any order, aka we get to brainstorm. And then when they die, exile the top card of your library, target opponent loses life equal to its mana value. If it's an instant or sorcery card, we may cast it without paying its mana cost. So very powerful effect if you can set it up. Hopefully you can put several instants and sorceries back on top of your library. So even if they kill it after two turns, you'll still get some value. And yeah, the effect is powerful, attached to a 5-4 flyer for 5, which is already pretty good. So this is definitely bomb status and gets an A. Then we have Black-Red, starting with Invasion of Asgol, a 2-mana battle. At Uncommon starts with 4 defense counters, and when it enters the battlefield, target player sacrifices a creature or planeswalker and loses one life. Typically, edict effects that make the opponent sacrifice a creature aren't amazing in Limited, since the opponent often has a smaller creature they don't mind sacrificing. Uh, let's see if the backside can make up for it. So if we defeat battle, we get access to Ashen Reaper, which is a 2-1 with menace, saying at the beginning of your end step, put a plus one plus one counter on it. If a permanent was put into a graveyard from the battlefield this turn. So this only happens in your end step. So it's not going to pick up a ton of counters necessarily unless you're actively sacrificing stuff, which of course is what Red Black is all about. Still not hugely convinced by this card and just giving it a C here, as the front side of the battle isn't all that exciting. Next up is the Stormclaw Rager, 3 mana, 2 2 Ogre Warrior at Uncommon, and this is another one of those key cards in its archetype. So a 2-2 that for one mana can sacrifice another creature or artifact, which is a pretty important distinction as all the uh, incubate cards will make artifacts that you can maybe sacrifice before having to turn it into a creature. 
And then we can put a plus one plus one counter on the Rager and to draw a card can only activate as a sorcery. It's a pretty powerful effect, especially if you can generate lots of smaller artifacts that you don't mind sacrificing or creatures. So this one seems quite powerful and we'll give it a B. Definitely the type of card you want to try and pick up early and build your deck around. Then Rankle and Torbrain are back. Now paired together, a 5 mana, 3, 4, legendary fairy dwarf and rare, with flying, first strike and haste. And when Rankle and Torbrand deal combat damage to a player or battle, we get to choose any number of the next three abilities. Each player creates a treasure token, so this is symmetrical. Each player sacrifices a creature. Or if a source would deal damage to a player or battle this turn, it deals that much damage plus two instead. So that's a pretty interesting ability, especially the last one, paired with a first strike on the Rankle and Torbrain, meaning we'll first get to hit the opponent, hopefully, or maybe a battle, and then we can still get an extra ability of dealing additional damage, which may affect the uh, rest of battle as well. So, yeah, overall a pretty powerful card. Double black, double reds is not the easiest on the mana necessarily, so won't be able to splash Rankle and Torbrain. And uh, it's not the biggest creature ever, just a 3-4 at the end of the day for 5 mana. But uh, still quite powerful. I don't think I quite give it the A rating, but at the very least a B, a card I'm happy to take early still. Next is Invasion of Ergamon. So this is our first red-green card. A 2 mana battle starts with 5 defense counters, so it takes quite a while to defeat. And then when it enters the battlefield, we create a treasure token, and then we may discard a card if we do draw a card. So it gives us a bit of card selection and a treasure token, but we did have to invest a whole card into it. So not sure if that's quite worth it. And then if we manage to defeat the battle, we get Truga Cliff Charger, a 3-4 Rhino with Trample. It says when it enters the battlefield, we may discard a card. If we do, search our library for a land or battle card, reveal it and put it into our hand. So pretty powerful if we do manage to transform it here, but um, yeah, still not super high on it overall, so we'll give it a C. Next is the Rampaging a Geoderm, a 4 mana, 3-3 three, three Dinosaur Beast and Uncommon with Trample and Haste. And whenever we attack, so it doesn't have to involve the Geoderm itself necessarily, target attacking creature gets plus 1 plus 1 until end of turn. If it's attacking a battle instead, put a plus 1 plus 1 counter on it. So again, the red-green cares about battles, and we've got quite a few creatures that reward us for attacking battles, this being a great example. Yeah, the Geoderm is powerful and gets a B rating. Seems like a great uncommon to take early and kind of build your red-green battle deck around. And of course, having a lot of cards like Geoderm also incentivizes you to include a few more battles in your limited deck. Otherwise, I would be kind of careful not to include too many battles in your deck because the more battles you play the less likely you are to have a lot of creatures on the battlefield to actually pressure them and then it's also going to be more difficult to defeat the battles which is where most of the value from the battles comes from is actually being able to defeat them so I would treat the battles kind of like you treat some of your typical non-creature spells just uh, play them in moderation and then they'll be pretty useful if you play too many of them then they will go down in value pretty dramatically. And next is Kogla and Yidaro. 6 mana, 7-7, seven, seven, a legendary ape, dinosaur, turtle and rare. And when it enters the battlefield we get to choose one. It gains trample and haste until end of turn, or it fights target creature we don't control. So very powerful 7-7 seven, seven for 6 that can fight when it enters, taking out an opposing creature. And then we can also pay 2, a red and a green, discard Kogla and Yidaro to destroy up to one target artifact or enchantment. Then we shuffle Kogla and Tidara into our library from our graveyard and draw a card. So if it's in the early game and we don't have six mana to cast Kogla and Tidara, then we can still maybe take out an artifact and enchantment while drawing a card in the process. And then maybe later we'll manage to redraw Kogla and Tidara. So yeah, this is a certified bomb. Happy to take it and hopefully end up red-green. Maybe with a bit of ramp to play it early but even at 6 mana it will be a nice way to stabilize. Next up we move on to green-white, so plus one plus one counters matters. And starting with Botanical Brawler, a 2 mana 0-0 zero, zero with Trample at Uncommon, but it enters the battlefield with 2 plus one plus one counters on it, so essentially a 2 mana 2-2 two, two Trampler. 
and whenever one or more plus one plus one counters are put on another permanent we control. If it's the first time plus one plus one counters have been put on that permanent this turn, put a plus one plus one counter on the brawler, which is not going to be too challenging, especially in green-white, with uh, some of the overlap between incubates working with plus one counters, but also the backup mechanic working with plus one counters. So brawler's a pretty important role player for the deck and gets a B grade as well. Next is Invasion of Moag, uh, 4 mana, 5 defense counter battle, and when it enters the battlefield put a plus 1 plus 1 counter on each creature you control. So ideally we can go wide with lots of tiny creatures and make them all bigger, and then the invasion can be quite impactful. If we're only controlling two creatures then this is not going to be incredibly exciting. And then if we manage to defeat it we get a Bloom Wielder Dryads, a 3-3 creature with a ward 2. And at the beginning of our end step, put a plus one plus one counter on target creature we control. Which is a nice ability, but it's not going to be all that easy to transform in the first place. So I'm not super high on this battle, just gonna give it a C. And next is Galta and Mavern, one of the more unlikely duos in the set. A 7 mana, 12-12 legendary dinosaur vampire at rare. It has trample and says whenever we attack, so it doesn't even have to involve Galt and Mavern themselves, just have to attack as soon as we play Galt and Mavern. We get to choose one, create a tapped and attacking XX green dinosaur creature token with trample, where X is the greatest power among other attacking creatures, or create X11 white vampire creature tokens with a lifelink, where X is the number of other attacking creatures. So if we're going wide, we can go even more wide with vampires that have lifelink. If we're going big, then we can make large trampling dinos that are also attacking. So that's the main difference here. The dinosaurs come into play tapped and attacking, whereas the vampires do not. So yeah, this is definitely bomb status. Then we move on to black-white, which is the Phyrexian tribal uh, color pair. And Invasion of New Capenna is a two-mana battle for defense. And when it enters the battlefield, we may sacrifice an artifact or creature. When we do, exile target artifact or creature an opponent controls. And then if we manage to defeat this battle, we get the Holy Frazzle Cannon, which is an equipment, so we can even get equipment from defeating battles. And equips for just one mana, saying whenever equipped creature attacks, put a plus one plus one counter on that creature and each other creature we control that shares a creature type with it. So of course in our Phyrexian tribal deck hopefully we'll be able to put a ton of plus one counters on our various Phyrexians. So overall card seems pretty powerful and gets a C+. This is the color pair that will be pretty good at generating the uh, various artifact tokens as we'll see later. So shouldn't have too many issues with uh, providing some sacrifice fodder to enable this in the first place. And then uh, the backside is also quite powerful. And next is Drana and Linvala. A 4-mana 3-4 legendary vampire angel at rare with flying and vigilance, saying activated abilities of creatures your opponents control cannot be activated. So that's typical of Linvala, of course. And then Adrana and Linvala has all activated abilities of all creatures your opponents control, and you may spend mana as though it were mana of any color to activate those abilities. So pretty decent creature overall. 3-4 with flying and vigilance is already quite powerful. Now, there aren't a ton of activated abilities in this limited set necessarily that Drana can shut down and then, of course, copy as well. So, I think that keeps it from being an A-tier level bomb. If there were more activated abilities, I could see this getting a higher grade. Next is Sculpted Perfection for mana Uncommon Enchantment. And when it enters the battlefield, Incubate 2. So this is our first instance of the new Incubate mechanic. So Incubate 2 means create an Incubator token with two plus one plus one counters on it, and we can pay two mana to transform this artifact. Now, the Incubator token is not a creature, it's simply an artifact token that chills on the battlefield with a few plus one plus one counters on it, depending on the number of Incubate, in this case two. And then once we pay the two mana, it transforms into a 0-0 zero, zero Phyrexian artifact creature that of course gets essentially plus two plus two thanks to those plus one plus one counters. It's a pretty strange mechanic, but it will eventually give us a bit of board presence. It will just take an extra mana investment 
to turn that artifact token into an artifact creature token. And then the Sculpted Perfection also says Phyrexians we control get plus one plus one. So if we play Perfection on turn four and then on the following turn pay the two mana to transform or incubate token, then we'll essentially have a 3-3 three, three, since it's a Phyrexian getting plus one plus one. And of course, the more Phyrexians we have, the better Sculpted Perfection gets. So if this is the only card in our deck that generates a Phyrexian, it's of course not that exciting, but in a Phyrexian tribal deck with a ton of Phyrexian synergy, this can easily get a B. Next is Invasion of Tolvada, a 5 mana, a rare battle, 5 defense counters, and when it enters the battlefield, return target a non-battle permanent card from your graveyard to the battlefield. Okay, so we can return creatures, enchantments, artifacts, even planeswalkers if we have those. And then if we manage to defeat the invasion, we get the Broken Sky an enchantment saying creature tokens we control get plus one plus so and have lifelink and at the beginning of our end step creates a 1-1 white and black spirit creature token with flying. So this is one of the more powerful battles if we manage to defeat them since we get an enchantment that's typically not that easy for the opponent to interact with and turn after turn we get additional spirit tokens with uh, flying and then those flying creatures also get pumped, getting an extra power and a lifelink. So going to make it very difficult for the opponent to race in a grindier game. So a powerful card. Of course, it does require us to have something exciting in the graveyard to get back in the first place. So hopefully we can maybe use Surveil, which is also in the sets, or maybe we can mill a few powerful cards into the graveyard to make this even better but I'm still going to give it at least a C+, plus since the uh, backside of the battle is so powerful if we manage to get to it. Next we get to Blue-Red, which is the Convoke Matters color pair in the set. So Blue-Red wants to make lots of small tokens and then use the Convoke mechanic to help pay for the more expensive spells by tapping those creatures. And we start with Invasion of Kaladesh, a blue and a red for a battle four defense counters, and when it enters the battlefield, create a 1-1 Thopter Artifact Creature token with flying. So not the best rate, two mana for a 1-1 flyer. And then what happens if we manage to defeat the invasion of Kaladesh? Then we get Aetherwing, a golden scale flagship, which is one of the few vehicles in the set. There's maybe only two or three in the set. And this has four toughness, power equal to the number of artifacts we control, and of course this being an artifact itself means at least one power, if we still control the Thopter token at least two, has flying, and crew cost is only one, so we can crew Aetherwing with the Thopter token potentially as well. So overall not a bad card, Thopter token can also be a good way of defeating the battle if the opponent doesn't have any flying creatures out, and then red also gives us access to a few burn spells to maybe help finish off some battles, which can also be helpful. So not a bad card, I'm gonna give it a C+. Also just making lots of small tokens in blue-red is gonna be important for Convoke, and the evasion can also be a nice way of defeating future battles if you have more of them. Next up we have Baral and Karizev, 3 mana, 2 for legendary human at rare with first strike and menace and says whenever we cast our first instant or sorcery spell each turn we may cast a spell with a lesser mana value that shares a card type with it from our hand without paying its mana cost. If we don't, which is probably the more likely outcome, create first mate Ragavan, a legendary 2-1 red monkey pirate creature token, it gains haste until end of turn. So yeah, getting to make an extra 2-1 token that gets to attack on top of a 2-4 first strike menace for 3, which is already quite efficient, leads to a B grade, quite powerful. Then we have a Joyful Storm Sculptor, a 5 mana, 2-3 human shaman at uncommon, and when the Storm Sculptor enters the battlefield, create 2-1-1 blue and red elemental creature tokens, and as we've discussed earlier, very important for blue-red to make multiple tokens to enable its various Convoke cards. And then whenever we cast a spell that has Convoke, the Storm Sculptor deals one damage to each opponent and each battle they protect. And that's on a 2-3 creature, so we get a decent amount of power and toughness on the board, and more importantly, lots of bodies to synergize with Convoke. So Storm Sculptor is going to be a pretty important card for the blue-red deck, Outside of the more dedicated Convoke decks, this is not the most exciting card, but uh, in the right deck this should perform quite well, so we'll give it a C+. 
Then we move on to black green and black green cares about the incubate mechanic and as we see here with the vat keeper a three mana three three that's uncommon and when it enters battlefield we get to incubate two and for five mana we can transform target incubator token we control double the number of plus one plus one counters on it. So all of a sudden we can make a 4-4 four, for four Axion as opposed to a 2-2 two, two, and we already get a 3 mana 3-3 three, three as a baseline. So yeah, this card is very powerful, gets a B. If we can keep making huge incubator tokens, it's not going to be too difficult to take over the game. And then we have Glissa, Herald of Predation. Glissa is back, now as a 5 mana 3-5 three, five for Axion at rare, saying at the beginning of combat on our turn. Choose one, we get to incubate two twice. We can also decide to transform all incubator tokens we control, or we can give Phyrexians we control first strike and death touch until end of turn, which is of course Glissa's hallmark ability. Yeah, Glissa seems very powerful indeed. First we're probably going to make some incubator tokens, and then uh, depending on the board we may decide to transform them or choose some other abilities, but can't really go wrong with Glissa. We essentially get immediate value unless the opponent can take out Glissa at instant speed before we get a chance to make those tokens. Try and play Glissa, I guess, if the opponent's tapped out to at least get to make a few incubator tokens. And uh, yeah, this is certainly a bomb. If Glissa goes unanswered, it will take over the game in no time. Then we have Invasion of Lorwyn, a six mana uncommon battle. 5 defense counters. When it enters the battlefield, destroy targets a non-elf creature an opponent controls with power X or less, where X is the number of lands we control. So pretty pricey removal spell, but uh, yeah, pretty powerful effect. And then if we manage to transform it, which will require quite a bit of effort admittedly, we get Winnowing Forces, which has power and toughness equal to the number of lands we control. So more synergy with controlling a lot of lands. If we maybe play this in a uh, ramp deck that can search up additional lands, it might get even better. But uh, yeah, overall pretty solid removal spell, quite pricey at six mana, and not the easiest to transform, but I'll still give it a C plus. And then Yargle and Multani is six mana for an 18-6. And yeah, just a vanilla creature, no abilities will probably require a bit of help to connect with the opponent, but as we'll see later, there are ways to potentially give it trample, ways to give it flying as well, or maybe even sacrifice it so it can deal damage equal to its power. So those are ways you can potentially synergize with Yargle and Multani. And even at the end of the day, a 6 mana 18-6, you know, 6 mana you think Colossal Dreadmaw, 6-6 six, six Trample is kind of the baseline. We don't have Trample, but instead of 6 power we get 18 power, so it's not a bad card, but it does need a little bit of help to really shine. So I'm gonna stick to a C plus for Yargle and Multani. Next we get to Red-White, which is the backup color pair in this set. So cards that synergize with backup will be even better in Red-White. So we've got the Mirror Shield Hoplite, a 2 mana, 2-2 two -two human soldier at Uncommon with Vigilance and says whenever a creature we control becomes the target of a backup ability, copy that ability, and we may choose new targets for the copy. This only triggers once each turn. So this is going to be very powerful if we can play this on turn 2 and then curve into uh, multiple backup creatures essentially, since we'll get a ton of extra plus 1 counters and a lot of abilities that are often favorable when we're trying to attack, as we'll get abilities like First Strike, Flying, maybe be able to tap down opposing creatures, making it easier to keep attacking. So in the right deck, Hoplite's going to be amazing, so we'll give it a B. And then we have Invasion of Killam, a 4 mana, uncommon battle, 5 defense counters, and when the invasion enters the battlefield, up to 2 target creatures each get plus 2 plus 0 and gain Vigilance and Haste until end of turn. So pretty weird to give creatures haste when it already costs us 4 mana to play the invasion, so I'm not sure if we're going to be able to play many other creatures alongside it. So, kind of awkward. If we manage to transform it, we get Valor's Reach Tag Team, which is a sorcery, creating two 3-2 three, two red and white warrior creature tokens that have a very strange ability as well. Whenever this creature and at least one other creature token attacks, 
put a plus one plus one counter on this creature. So if both tokens manage to attack, I guess they turn into four three creatures. So they do hit pretty hard, admittedly. But the front side of the battle still doesn't get me too excited. Unless we compare it with some evasive creatures. So I'm just going to give it a C overall. Then Jeru and Hazaret are back, now paired together. Uh, 5 mana, 5-4 five, legendary human god at rare. And as long as we have one or fewer cards in hand, Jeru and Hazaret have Vigilance and Haste. So we could be smacking the opponent with a 5-4 on turn 5 potentially. And whenever Jeru and Hazaret attack, look at the top 6 cards of our library. We may exile a legendary creature card from among them, put the rest on the bottom, and then until end of turn we may cast the exiled card without paying its mana cost. Now, there are quite a few legendaries in this limited format, mostly thanks to the multiverse legends that are kind of the bonus sheet, so we'll see at least one of those in each pack. But even without that extra ability, a 5-4 with potentially haste and vigilance is also quite powerful. So this certainly gets at least a B. If we could consistently attack with it the turn we played it, and we could consistently hit legendary creatures, then this could easily get up to the bomb range. But uh, for now we'll keep it in the B tier, but probably like a B plus if we were handing out B pluses. Next is Quintorius Loremaster, a 5 mana, 3 5 legendary elf and cleric and rare, has vigilance, and says at the beginning of our end step, exile target non creature, non land card from our graveyard, and then create a 3 2 red and white spirit creature token. So keep in mind, battles also count as non creature, non land cards nowadays, and then we can pay 3 mana, tap Quintorius, sacrifice a spirit, and then choose a card exiled with Quintorius. We may cast that card this turn without paying its mana cost, and then if it would be put into a graveyard, put it on the bottom of its owner's library instead, because of course exiling it would let us get it back once again. So Quintorius is an interesting card, um, doesn't really synergize all that well with the backup theme of red-white, which is more of like a creature aggro deck. Quintorius plays better in a more controlling strategy, so this might be a card you want to splash in your blue-red deck, for instance, and then it might be a little bit better. So with that awkwardness in mind, it's still very powerful if you can get it going, so we'll give it at the very least a B, but in the right deck this can easily take over the game. Then we get to blue-green, which as we mentioned in the archetype breakdown, cares about transforming permanents. Not only transforming battles, but transforming incubator tokens, transforming its various creatures as well as we've seen, turning them into Phyrexians. And Invasion is a 2 mana 4 defense counter battle, Invasion of Pyrulia, and says when it enters the battlefield, scry 3, then reveal the top card of our library if it's a land or double faced card, draw a card. So again, double-faced could include battles, could include some of our creatures as well, and we can always potentially reveal a land, which is probably the baseline. So not a bad effect for two mana. And then if we manage to defeat the battle, we get a Gargantuan Slabhorn, which is a 4-4 Trampler with Ward 2, and says other transformed permanents we control have Trample and Ward 2. So not a bad effect. So yeah, we'll give this a C plus overall, pretty decent two-drop. Then we have the Mutagen Connoisseur, a 3 mana 05 Vidalcan Mutant at Uncommon with Flying and Vigilance. Connoisseur gets plus 1 plus 0 for each transformed permanent we control, which again can include some of our creatures as well as battles if we can take those out. So it's not going to start out with a lot of power, but it does have a lot of defense and can uh, probably help protect battles that the opponent plays as well as uh, just soak up a lot of damage until we slowly start transforming some of our permanents, at which point the Connoisseur can uh, potentially take out battles we play ourselves as well. So not a bad card, does require us to build around it somewhat, but uh, at the very least a C+. And then we have Inga and Esika, they're back, a 4 mana, 4-4, four, four, a legendary human god at rare, says creatures we control have vigilance and can tap to add one man of any color that we can spend only to cast a creature spell. So reminiscent of Esika's ability, but now applies to all our creatures and not only legendaries. 
And then whenever we cast a creature spell, if three or more mana from creatures was spent to cast it, we get to draw a card. So it doesn't take too much to draw a few cards with Inga and Asika. And at the end of the day, it's still a four mana 4-4, four four, so it's pretty well statted and not only generates mana, but also draws cards. So this seems like a bomb to me. If we can play enough creatures to keep drawing cards, then it kind of fuels itself, because the more creatures we have, the easier it is to draw even more cards afterwards. And then we get to some of the multicolor cards in uh, three different color pairs. We have Croxa and Kunoros, which is a mythic rare, six mana, six, six in red, white, and black, so a Mardu colored 6-drop. And it's a legendary Elder Giant Dog with Vigilance, Menace, and Lifelink. So a lot of keywords, and when Croxa and Kunoros enter the battlefield or attacks, we get to exile 5 cards from our graveyard when we do, so it is a requirement, return target creature card from our graveyard to the battlefield. So if we have a very full graveyard, we can start reanimating some of our cards as well. Not going to be all that easy to get back multiple cards from our graveyard, since we're probably going to empty it with uh, exiling five cards. But we're mostly just looking at a 6-6 six, six with Vigilance, Menace and Lifelink, which is already quite powerful. So I think this is deserving of bomb status. So we'll give it an A even though three colors wouldn't be all that easy to support, because it's three colors on a six drop, we have a little bit more time to find all the missing colors and get some mana fixing in there. And then we have Borborygmos and Fibblethip, which is five mana in the Teemur colors, so two, a green, a blue, and a red, for a 6-5 legendary Cyclops homunculus at Mythic. And when Borborygmos and Fibblethip enter the battlefield or attack, we get to draw a card regardless, and then we may discard any number of land cards. When we discard one or more cards this way, Borborygmos and Fibblethip deal twice that much damage to target creature. You can also pay one and a blue to put Borborygmos and Fibblethip into its owner's library, third from the top. So if we have spare mana, the potent threatens to take out or legend, then we can potentially protect it and put it back. Even if we're not discarding any cards to the ability, we still get to draw whenever we play Borborygmos and attack with it. So that seems incredibly powerful on a 5-drop, no less. And then the green is probably the color pair that will have the most mana fixing, making it easier to potentially get to the third color. So yeah, this is another bomb. We'll give it an A. And then Athalia and the Gidrog monster are pairing up as well. Four mana in the Abzan colors, so one a white, a black, and a green for a 4-4 legendary human frog horror at Mythic, has First Strike and Death Touch, and says we may play an additional land on each of our turns, and creatures and non-basic lands your opponent's control enter the battlefield tapped, and whenever Thalia and the Gidrog attack, sacrifice a creature or land and then draw a card. So a ton of useful abilities. Now my main concern with Thalia and the Gidrog is it is a 4-drop that's three different colors, which is not going to be easy to achieve in Limited, even though we rated some of the other three color cards pretty highly, at least those were a bit more on the expensive side, so it's more realistic to find our colors by the time we need to cast a 6-drop as opposed to a 4-drop. If we're not playing Thalia and the Gidrog on turn 4, it does start losing a little bit of value, since it's the type of card you want to try and play early to really leverage it. So. The color concerns is what's keeping me from giving this an A, but at the very least a B. So still a very powerful card that I'm happy to try and build around. Then we have Zurgo and Ojutai. Five mana in the Jeskai colors, so two, a blue, a red, and a white. For a 4-4 legendary orc dragon at Mythic Rare, has flying and haste, combining Ojutai and Zurgo's abilities. And Zerg and Ojutai has Hexproof as long as it entered the battlefield this turn. So we should be able to play it and attack with it right away unopposed. And then whenever one or more dragons we control deal combat damage to a player or battle, we get to look at the top three cards of our library, put one of them into our hand and the rest on the bottom of our library in any order. And then we may return one of those dragons to its owner's hand. So if we suspect the opponent's holding removal, we can pick up Zurgo and Ojutai again, 
so we can play it on the following turn with Hexproof to keep hitting the opponent and gaining more card advantage. Of course, once again, three colors being the main challenge. But uh, this one at least costs five mana, so we've got a bit more time to find the right colors. And uh, blue card draw can also help with that. So I'll give this one an A, another bomb. And then a Zimone and Dina is a three mana, three four legendary human dried at Mythic in the Sultai color pair. So black, green, and blue. And says whenever we draw our second card each turn, target opponent loses two life and we gain two life. Can tap Zimon and Dina, sacrifice another creature to draw a card, and then we may put a land card from our hand onto the battlefield tapped. If we control eight or more lands, we get to repeat this process once. So that's also quite powerful, potentially getting to draw multiple cards with that ability. Now the main concern with Zimon and Dina is having enough creatures to sacrifice in the first place. And if we run out of creatures, then we will no longer be able to use the ability. So do need to make sure we're playing this in a deck that has enough sacrifice fodder. So I'm going to give this a B, just because it's going to be tricky to get all three colors in play by the time we want to cast Zimon and Dina. But even later in the game, this should be quite powerful. And then last but not least, Invasion of Alara is one of each color. So five mana for a battle with seven defense counters on it. So it's going to be quite challenging to transform. And when Invasion of Alara enters battlefield, exile cards from the top of our library until we exile two non-land cards with mana value four or less. We may cast one of those two cards without paying its mana cost, and then put one of those into our hand instead. So it's sort of like a double cascade, but one of the cards we cast and one we put in hand. And then I put the other cards exiled this way on the bottom of our library in a random order. So, 5 mana for a weird double cascade. You know, it's not bad, but of course the main challenge is getting all 5 colors in play, which is going to be quite challenging and limited. And then if we do somehow manage to transform this, we get Awaken the Maelstrom, which is a sorcery, has all colors, and says target player draws 2 cards, that's the blue part. Then we may put an artifact card from our hand onto the battlefield, we get to create a token that's a copy of a permanent we control. Distribute three plus one plus one counters among one, two or three creatures we control. That's I guess the green part. And then destroy target permanent an opponent controls, which is kind of a black ability. So it's got most of the colors represented on this powerful sorcery. But uh, yeah, getting to cast it in the first place is going to be quite the challenge. And then I guess we forgot about Omnath. Locus of All. This one is all five colors, but the black mana is Phyrexian mana, so we can technically cast Omnath in a four-color deck that isn't playing black, as we can pay two life for it instead. So that does make it a lot more realistic to cast as opposed to having all five colors. And then Omnath is a 4-4 legendary Phyrexian elemental at a rare, so this one's not a mythic says if we would lose unspent mana, that mana becomes black instead, which is a nice upside. And then at the beginning of our pre combat main phase, look at the top card of our library. We may reveal that card if it has three or more colored mana symbols in its mana cost. If we do, add three mana in any combination of its colors and put it into our hand. If we don't reveal it, we can still put it into our hand. So regardless, Omnath essentially draws us an extra card each turn. If we happen to have some three color cards, then it gets even better. Seems worth going for, even though it's still a bit of a challenge. This one's a bit more realistic, so we'll give it a C plus. So let's start with uh, white here. Elspeth's Smite is up first, and as you'll notice, we're going in order of lowest mana cost to highest mana cost. So first is our one mana Elspeth's Smite. It deals three damage to target attacking or blocking creature. If that creature would die this turn, exile it instead. So not a bad removal spell. Of course, this type of effect is going to be a little bit better in a more defensive deck where the opponent is more likely to be the one attacking and then you've got a nice cheap one mana removal spell. But even an aggressive deck, you can always attack the opponent blocks and then three damage may be able to finish off a larger blocker. So give it a C plus, just a nice cheap removal spell. Enduring Bond Warden is our first instance of backup. A one mana 01 human scout at common. 
and has backup 1, meaning when this creature enters the battlefield, put a plus 1 plus 1 counter on target creature, can be the Bond Warden itself, but typically we're going to want to target different creatures, because if that's another target creature, it gains the following ability until end of turn. And the ability in this case is, when this creature dies, put its counters on a target creature we control. So we essentially get, at the very least, a 1 mana 1-2, one, but maybe we can also put a plus 1 counter on a different creature, instead of on the Bond Warden, and then if that creature dies we can move its plus 1 counters elsewhere, which can sometimes come in handy. Still not the most impactful backup creature, and still only gonna give it a D grade, but uh, maybe in a very dedicated green-white plus 1 plus 1 counter deck, for instance, I could see Bond Warden making the cut. But uh, yeah, not the most impactful card. And next up is Cor Halberd, a 1 mana equipment at common. Says equipped creature gets plus 1 plus 1 and has vigilance and equips for just a single mana. So it's very cheap to play and equip. Vigilance could also be especially useful in this set with uh, various battles that you need to be able to attack. But at the same time you also want to keep creatures back on defense so the opponent doesn't get to quickly play a battle and defeat it if you're all tapped out. Still not an incredibly high priority card, but uh, still quite powerful and I'm happy to play even one or two of these in my aggressive white decks. Next is Progenitor Exarch, which is a rare for double X and white, a 1-2 Phyrexian Cat Cleric, and when it enters the battlefield, incubate 3 X times. So the math here is a little bit complicated, but let's say we play Exarch for X equals 1, so a 3 mana total, we get a 1-2 that incubates 3, so we get a incubator token with 3 plus 1 plus 1 counters on it, that for 2 mana we can transform into a Phyrexian creature. Or we can play Exarch for 5 mana total, in which case we get 2 3-3 three, three, uh, incubator tokens essentially, or we can go up to 7 mana, and then we get 3 of those instead. So it does scale pretty nicely into the late game, and then once we have the Exarch in play we can tap it, transform target incubator token we control. So now we can forego having to pay 2 mana to transform our incubator tokens, and we can simply tamp the Exarch instead. So that saves us quite a bit of mana in games where we make a lot of incubator tokens. So yeah, Exarch's quite powerful and gets a B grade. Gives us a nice board presence. Next is Surge of Salvation, a 1 mana uncommon instant. Says we and permanents we control gain hexproof until end of turn, Prevent all damage that black and or red sources would deal to creatures we control this turn. So as we'll notice, there's a whole cycle of these kind of color hosers, you could say, uh, in every color at Uncommon. These are typically not that exciting to main deck in Limited, because they're pretty targeted at being good against certain colors, and if you're not up against, in this case, black or red, then Surge of Salvation is not that exciting. It's kind of a conditional protection spell, which is still kind of clunky to keep up, and yeah, overall I would not recommend playing this unless you know for sure that your opponent is black and or red, so I see this more as a niche sideboard card that you should avoid main decking, and therefore gets a D grade. And next is our first creature that can transform. Tarkir Dune Shaper is 1 mana for a 1-2 Dog Warrior at common, and then we can pay 4 and a green Phyrexian mana, so we can either pay 2 life and 4 mana, or 4 mana and an additional green mana, so 5 total, to transform the Dune Shaper, and can only activate this as a sorcery. And then the 1 mana 1-2 transforms into a 4-3 Trampler, and uh, essentially has haste, you could say, because if we play our 1-drop early in the game and then transform it, the 4-3 Trample can attack right away, so that's pretty nice. Still a pretty hefty investment, the 1-2 early on not that impactful, and it does cost us quite a bit of mana or potentially even life to transform into a 4-3 Trample. So still only going to give it a C grade, but it's a pretty powerful card for a common for sure. And next is Aerial Boost, a 2 mana instant that common has Convoke. So a reminder, Convoke says our creatures can help cast this spell. Each creature we tap while casting this spell pays for a generic mana or one mana of that creature's colors. So let's say we tap 
a green creature and a white creature to cast aerial boost then we can essentially cast it for free if the opponent doesn't expect it especially that could be quite powerful because target creature gets plus two plus two and gains flying until end of turn so this could be a pretty nice comma trick defensively let's say we just have some creatures back on defense we're fully tapped out opponent attacks thinking they have a good attack and all of a sudden we can tap two of our creatures to convoke aerial boost to give plus two plus two in flying maybe even ambush an opposing flyer if we have enough creatures back on defense so that could be quite nice but we can also use this to kind of be mana efficient let's say we want to be attacking we can maybe play a creature and then use a summoning sick creature to help convoke aerial boost if that still works so that can maybe save us one mana so not bad for a combo trick uh, thanks to that convoke mechanic so I'm going to give it a C. Overall, I'm still not going to go super high on most combo tricks unless they also maybe draw a card in the process. So still just a C for aerial boost, but uh, we'll make it kind of tricky to play around since even if the opponent's tapped out, they may still be representing a convoke card. And next is the Alabaster Host Sanctifier. Two mana, two two frags and cleric at common with a lifelink. We've often seen two mana, two two lifelink in whites at common before think of the unicorn in dominaria and they're typically quite powerful because white will have access to equipment and plus one counters and auras to make their creatures bigger so then the life link will scale quite nicely into the late game and uh, yeah that's no exception here the host sanctifier gets a c plus just a very solid two drop Next is Angelic Intervention, another combat trick. Two mana instant at common, says target creature or planeswalker we control gains protection from a colorless or from the color of our choice until end of turn. If it's a creature, put a plus one plus one counter on it. So yeah, nice defensive trick. Getting a plus one counter is a nice bonus, but it does cost us two mana. Still just gonna give it a C. If you are in the market for combo tricks, this will do. Can maybe help you attack by some blockers if the opponent only has blockers of a single color back. Next is a Dusk Legion Duelist, a 2 mana 2 2 vampire soldier at rare, has a vigilance, and says whenever one or more plus one plus one counters are put on Dusk Legion Duelist, draw a card. This ability triggers only once each turn. So as we've uh, seen with the backup mechanic, there are a lot of easy ways to put plus one counters on our creatures and it does only take a few plus one counters to get a ton of value with the duelist. The built-in vigilance also means we can play offense and defense with it, so it's not a bad place to put our plus one counters. So I'm gonna give this a B. Next up is Invasion of Gobakan, a two mana rare battle. And this one's pretty easy to defeat, only three defense counters. And when it enters the battlefield, look at target opponent's hand. We may exile a non-land card from it. For as long as that card remains exiled, its owner may play it, but has to pay two more mana to cast it. So similar to Elite Spellbinder's ability, essentially. And then if we manage to defeat it, we get a Light Shield Array, an enchantment saying at the beginning of our end step, put a plus one plus one counter on each creature that attacked this turn. And we can also sacrifice it, and then creatures we control gain hexproof and indestructible until end of turn. So this will be at its best in a deck with lots of smaller evasive creatures that can keep attacking, and then slowly pick up plus one counters over time. There are quite a few flying creatures of course in white, but they tend to be a little bit more on the expensive side, so you're not going to see a lot of one or two mana flyers. But uh, nonetheless, still a pretty powerful battle, because it's so cheap to actually take it out so this one gets a b and then of course the information and hand disruption it provides can also throw off the opponent's curve significantly next is norns inquisitor a two mana one one phyrexian knight at uncommon when it enters the battlefield incubate two and whenever a permanent we control transforms into a phyrexian put a plus one plus one counter on it so it essentially turns or incubates two into a three three phyrexian creature if it transforms and any future incubate will also get better, so pretty nice for a 2-drop, providing a ton of power and toughness, even though we do need to potentially invest more mana into it. So this one also gets a B. And then we've got the Realm Breakers a Grasp, candidate for one of the best white commons in the set, a 2-mana enchantment aura, 
and enchants an artifact or creature, and then the enchanted permanent cannot attack or block, and its activated abilities cannot be activated unless they're mana abilities. So kind of your pacifism effect of the set, but also shuts down activated abilities, so kind of similar to an arrest, but only costs two mana, so quite powerful for a common and gets a B. Next is the Sun Blast Guardian, a 2 mana, 2-2 two, two, uncommon human cleric, and this one can also transform for 5 and a red Phyrexian mana, so 6 mana if we have red, or potentially 5 mana and 2 life, which means we can also play this outside of red-white. Let's say we're a green-white aggro deck, then we can still easily transform the Guardian without needing red mana, which is quite useful. And then it transforms into the Furnace Blast Conqueror, which is a 3-3, and whenever the Conqueror attacks, create a tapped and attacking token that's a copy of it, put a Plus Ampus Swank Counter on that token for each Plus Ampus Swank Counter on the Conqueror, and then sacrifice a token at the beginning of the next end step. So this will work quite nicely in the red-white backup deck, where you're naturally going to put a lot of Plus Swank Counters on your creatures, in which case the token also gets better. And yeah, you are potentially attacking for 6 damage on turn 5, so that's pretty neat. So not bad for a 2-drop that provides additional utility in the late game, gets a C+. Then we have Sunder the Gateway, a 2-mana sorcery at common. Choose one, either destroy target non-token artifact or enchantment an opponent controls, and we get to incubate two. Or we can incubate two and then transform an incubator token we control, which is a pretty convoluted way of just making a 2-2 two -two for 2-mana. Two so yeah. Pretty interesting card. There are not a ton of artifacts and enchantments that aren't tokens in the set, because most artifacts will be opposing incubate tokens. So it's not necessarily going to find a ton of targets in the set, but some of the artifacts and enchantments that are in the set could be quite powerful. Think of some of the battles that transformed, for instance. So still a card I'm pretty happy to main deck in my white decks. Not going to prioritize it, but Still happy to have it, so we'll give it a C. Next is a Sword Sworn Cavalier, 2 mana, 3 1 human knight at common. And it has first strike as long as another knight entered the battlefield under our control this turn. So this will be at its best in the blue white knight tribal deck. I've also double checked to see if there weren't a lot of knights that we can play at instant speed to maybe get first strike in the opponent's turn, and I couldn't find very many knights with flash. So we're mostly going to get first strike in our own turn to keep attacking. So yeah, decent filler card in the knight deck, otherwise not a priority, so we'll give it a C. Then we have the Attentive Skywarden, 3 mana, 2-2 two -two Phyrexian, Flyer at common, and when it deals common damage to a player or battle, we get to transform a 2-1 target incubator token we control. So specifically in black-white, where you care about Phyrexians and about transforming incubator tokens, this could be a pretty solid role player. Outside of the black-white deck, probably not super exciting. So I'm just going to give it a C. The black-white deck should be able to pick this up pretty late in the draft. Then we have Cut Short, a 3-mana instant at common with Convoke. It says destroy target Planeswalker that was activated this turn or a tapped creature. So the fact that this has Convoke once again means we can potentially cast it by just tapping three creatures, even if we don't have any mana available. So we'll give it a C+. Not quite as unconditional in nature as some other removal spells in the B tier, but uh, still quite powerful. Next is Guardian of Girapur, a 3-mana three 3-3 three, three Angel at rare. It flies, and when it enters the battlefield, we can exile up to one other target creature or artifact we control, and then return it to the battlefield at the beginning of the next end step. So we can essentially flicker a creature or artifact. Sadly cannot flicker opposing creatures or artifacts, otherwise we could maybe permanently exile an opposing incubator token. So that's probably something they wanted to avoid. But we can still potentially re-enable an enters the battlefield ability. Could be good with a backup mechanic as well. And uh, there's quite a few creatures, of course, with powerful ETB effects in the set. So it doesn't take much to get even more value out of the Guardian. And already a 3-3 flyer for 3 is quite powerful. So this is kind of the high end of B. Maybe A- minus if I were to give A-. minus, But quite powerful for sure. Next is Invasion of Belenon. 
a three mana battle with five defense counters at uncommon and when it enters the battlefield we get to make a 2-2 white and blue knight creature token with vigilance and if we manage to defeat it we get an anthem saying creatures we control get plus one plus one so very powerful if we do manage to transform it so it might be worth it to take this one out and we'll give this a c plus three mana two two knight with vigilance is not exciting these days but especially in a knight tribal deck where the knight creature type is relevant this will get even better and then in a deck with maybe some flying creatures that can help pressure the battle this will be a very nice anthem next is invasion of dominaria three mana uncommon battle with five defense counters and when it enters the battlefield we gain four life and draw a card there's not a huge life gain sub theme in any of the limited archetypes but of course gaining life is still a nice upside and then especially in like a blue white flyers archetype it's going to be easier to pressure the invasion and transform it and then we essentially get a sarah angel a 4-4 flying vigilance which is still quite powerful and limited these days so while it doesn't have an impact the turn we played necessarily unless we can transform it right away it's still a pretty decent battle and we'll give it a c plus next is invasion of theros a three mana rare battle with four defense counters and when it enters the battlefield search or library for an aura god or demigod card reveal it and put it into our hand invasion of theros is going to struggle to have a lot of targets to search up and then we're still paying three mana to find one of them which doesn't seem quite worth it but let's see what happens if we manage to defeat invasion of theros then we get Ephara, ever sheltering a 4-4 legendary enchantment creature god and Ephara has a lifelink and indestructible as long as we control at least three other enchantments and whenever another enchantment enters a battlefield under our control we get to draw a card so very powerful in a dedicated enchantment deck sadly enchantments aren't heavily supported in this set so you're gonna struggle to have a ton of enchantments to synergize with Ephara so I think that keeps this card from being as powerful as it could be otherwise so I'm just gonna land on a C overall but if you're a deck with some powerful auras to search up then definitely go for it next is Kithkin Billy Rider a three mana one three Kithkin Knight at common with double strike so doesn't seem particularly impressive at first glance but once you factor in all the synergies across the different archetypes this card becomes a lot more appealing of course it's a knight to synergize with a blue white knight's tribal archetype and then it also plays quite well with the backup mechanic since there's a ton of ways to put plus one counters on the billy rider and then it will get even more power which synergizes very well with double strike also works quite well with any pump spells or equipments and we've seen a couple equipment already so we'll give the billy rider a c plus next up is monastery mentor reprinted here as a three mana to do human monk and mythic with prowess and whenever we cast a non-creature spell create a one one white monk creature token with prowess battles of course count as non-creature spells for prowess and uh, we might have some other non-creature spells like comma tricks or removal spells in enchantment form but um, yeah mentor would be a lot more powerful if it were in blue or red so that's maybe where you want to pair it with like a blue white deck with a lot of blue spells that can trigger prowess and mentor to make monk tokens or maybe a red white deck with a lot of non-creature spells as well or maybe even a three color deck who knows but uh, yeah in the right deck with enough non-creature spells this is going to be taking over the game very quickly so we'll give it a b in a deck that can actually enable it it's easily bomb status then we have Phyrexian Awakening, a 3 mana uncommon enchantment. When it enters the battlefield, incubate 4. So will cost us 2 more mana to turn our incubator token into a Phyrexian. But in the meantime, Phyrexians we control have Vigilance, as the Awakening is going to stay on the battlefield as an enchantment. So yeah, in the black-white Phyrexian tribal deck, this should be quite powerful. And even outside of it, it's still not the worst rate as we'll eventually be left with a 4-4 vigilance even if it does cost us five mana total 
we can at least split it up into a few different pieces. So this one gets a B. Then we have Phyrexian Sensor, a 3-mana three 3-3 three, three Phyrexian Wizard at Uncommon. It says each player cannot cast more than one non-Phyrexian spell each turn, and non-Phyrexian creatures enter the battlefield tapped. So this is symmetrical, so I have to be a little bit careful with it, but hopefully you're playing this in a black-white Phyrexian Matters deck, and then it's going to mostly affect the opponent, in which case it's a very powerful effect. So, in black-white specifically, I'm willing to give this a, a C+, maybe even verging on a B. Outside of the more dedicated Phyrexian Tribal decks, you have to be careful with including the sensor, just double-check your creature types. Next is Scroll Shift, 3 mana instant at common, and this will essentially flicker an artifact, creature or enchantment we control, returning it to the battlefield under its owner's control after exiling it, and we get to draw a card in the process. So getting to flicker or backup creatures could be quite nice, getting to get an extra plus one counter, can use this to maybe save a creature that's targeted by a removal spell, can also flicker a creature after it's being locked down by an opposing aura. So there are definitely a lot of use cases where scroll shift will come in handy. The main drawback is three manas, a little bit expensive to keep up, so it's not going to be easy to maybe save a creature in response to your typical removal spell. But uh, yeah, still a playable card. I don't think we should prioritize it during the draft, but the decks that want it should be able to pick one up. And then it's a nice one-off to have, but I also wouldn't overdo it unless you have a lot of powerful ETB effects to abuse. Next we have Seal from Existence. A 3-mana uncommon enchantment, although it does cost double white, so that's what uh, kind of differentiates it from a typical banishing light or um, oblivion ring type effect. But the upside is it does have ward 3 built in, so when it enters the battlefield, exile target a non-land permanent and opponent controls until seal of from existence leaves the battlefield. So a very nice removal effect, and this time it's going to be a little bit more expensive for the opponent to get rid of. So it makes it a much more reliable removal spell. So we'll give this a B, even though it's not the easiest to cast. You do need to be pretty heavy white to cast this early on. It's still very powerful and quite efficient as well. Then we have the Seraph of New Capenna, a 3-mana 2-2 uncommon angel soldier with flying. And this one transforms for 4 and a black Phyrexian mana. So it can be 4 mana 2 life, or 4 and a black, so 5 total. But again, we can easily play this outside of black-white. And then it transforms into a 3-3 three, three flyer, saying when it attacks, we may sacrifice another creature or artifact. If we do, the Seraph gets plus 2, plus 1 until end of turn. So this will be at its best in your black-white Phyrexian Matters deck, where you might have some incubator tokens that you can sacrifice before having transformed them, and then we get to pump up our flyer to get in 5 damage at a time, which is quite significant. So not bad, we'll give this a C+. Then we have Sigiled Sentinel, a 3-mana 2-2 Human Knight at common with backup 1, and the extra keyword we can potentially grant with backup is Vigilance. So on an empty board this is essentially a 3-3 Vigilance, but if you already have a creature in play, we might be able to give it a plus one counter and then vigilance until end of turn. So that's just a nice upside. And of course a knight, which is a relevant creature type in this set. So fine creature, we'll give it a C. I don't think it's quite a C plus, but a fine filler card for a lot of different decks. And then we have the Jalfren Lancer, three mana, three three human knight at uncommon says whenever another knight enters a battlefield under our control, it gets plus one plus one and gains vigilance until end of turn. So baseline three mana three three, but in a knight tribal deck this can easily grow over time. And uh, yeah, it's not limited to getting plus one plus one once each turn, it can potentially grow multiple times. And then vigilance, as we've said, quite useful when we're contesting battles. So, yeah, in the right deck, I could see this performing quite well. Give it a C+. Next is Archangel Elspeth, one of the few Planeswalkers in the set. And Elspeth does not mess around. 
for loyalty and has a plus one ability making a 1-1 one, one white soldier creature token with lifelink. The minus two puts two plus one plus one counters on that target creature. It becomes an angel in addition to its other types and gains flying. Now do keep in mind there's no flying counter being placed on your creature. They probably wanted to avoid putting both plus one counters and a flying counter on a creature since it might be confusing. But there are other cards in the set that do work with flying counters, so just don't forget about the creature permanently gaining flying. And then the minus six says return all non-land permanent cards with mana value three or less from your graveyard to the battlefield. But I think we can easily work with just a plus one and minus two repeatedly. So yeah, Elspeth is very powerful, protect itself by making one one tokens. And then the lifelink paired with uh, flying is going to make it almost impossible for the opponent to outrace. So Elspeth definitely verges on the S tier. Um, still going to stick to an A because there are certainly board states where Elspeth isn't quite going to catch you back up from being behind if you're too far behind. If the board is somewhat even, then Elspeth will easily win you the game. So certified bomb. Next is Bola Slinger, a 4 mana 2-2 two, two cat soldier at common with backup 1. And the ability, whenever this creature attacks, tap target artifact or creature an opponent controls. So very nice ability to have in an aggressive deck. And uh, yeah, especially if you can use the backup ability to put a plus 1 counter on a different creature and be able to tap something down for a turn. Then on the following turn the Slinger itself can attack and tap something down and hopefully you can play multiple slingers to make it impossible for the opponent to block or maybe pair it with other combo tricks or removal and that's going to be pretty powerful for any aggressive strategy so i think this is one of the better white commons we'll give it a c plus and then it's time for elish norn a four mana three five legendary frex imperator at mythic with vigilance and says whenever a source an opponent controls deals damage to you or a permanent you control, that source's controller loses two life unless they pay one mana. So this applies to every creature the opponent has that would deal damage to our creatures or to us. So the opponent's going to be very taxed by Elish Norn's ability. And then we can pay two and a white, sacrifice three other creatures, exile Elish Norn and return it to the battlefield transformed and only activate this as a sorcery. So Elish Norn already quite impactful as a 4 mana 3-5 Vigilance, taxing the opponent. But once we transform it, let's have a look. The Argent Etchings starts by incubating 2 5 times and then transform all incubator tokens you control. So this essentially adds 10 power and toughness to the board with just a first chapter. Then on chapter 2, creatures we control get plus one plus one and gain double strike until end of turn. So that already triggers on the following turn after having transformed Elish Norn. And uh, we just made five two twos at the very least. So that ability is going to hit incredibly hard, potentially just win us the game on the spot. Just in case it didn't, on the third chapter, destroy all other permanents except for artifacts, lands and Phyrexians. And then uh, transform it back into Elish Norn essentially. So yeah, this is an S level card for sure. If you can uh, activate Elish Norn and transform it, it's probably game over. Next is Heliod, the Radiant Dawn. 4 mana, 4-4 four, four legendary enchantment creature god at rare. And when Heliod enters the battlefield, return target enchantment card that isn't a god from your graveyard to your hand. As we discussed earlier, there's not a ton of enchantments necessarily in the set. So not expecting that ability to necessarily get anything back here. And then for three and a Phyrexian blue mana, we can transform Heliod into Heliod the Warped Eclipse, which is a 4-6, saying we may cast spells as though they had flash, and spells cost one generic less to cast for each card our opponent has drawn this turn. So that's instant speed we can start casting spells during the opponent's turn at a discount basically and if they've drawn any additional cards our cards become even cheaper so it's gonna make it pretty tricky for the opponent to expect what we're gonna play next 
it is a bit of an investment to transform it, admittedly, but at the uh, very least we have a 4-4 four, four at uh, 4 mana, which is not too bad. So yeah, he leaves quite powerful and at the very least gets a B. And then we have Inspired Charge, which we've seen in a lot of different sets, and it ranges from being one of the best finishers to being kind of a mediocre card. 4 mana instance at common, saying creatures we control get plus 2 plus 1 until end of turn. Now, there's not a ton of different archetypes in this set that really make a ton of small tokens, especially not in white. Of course, there's a few knights that make knight tokens, but it's not like there's a ton of commons making lots of small 1-1 one -one tokens. So that's where Inspire Charge would be at its best, which means I'm not super high on Inspire Charge as a finisher, but it is still an important card to keep in mind if the opponent's attacking all out and has access to enough mana to cast it. So we'll give it a C. Then we have Knight of the New Coalition, a 4 mana 2-2 two -two human knight with vigilance, and when it enters it makes another 2-2 two -two white and blue knight creature token with vigilance. So totally fine curve filler for the knight deck. Vigilance also quite good with Convoke, since you can maybe attack with a creature and then still tap it for Convoke. So it does have quite a bit of synergy there too. I think it's still probably going to end up being more of a curve filler as opposed to a very exciting card you're going to take early. So I'm going to land on a C for Knight of the New Coalition, but it's probably one of the better Cs I'm handing out here. Then we have Tiller of Flesh, 4 mana 2 4, saying whenever we cast a spell that targets one or more permanents, Incubate 2. So if we cast a removal spell, we get to incubate. If we cast a pump spell, we can maybe incubate. So a pretty decent card. Gets a C+, will be at its best in the black-white archetype. Next is the Boonbringer Valkyrie, one of the better backup cards in the set. 5 mana, 4-4 four, four Angel Warrior at rare, backup 1, and has a ton of useful abilities. Flying, First Strike, and a Life Link. So if this is our only creature, it's essentially a 5-5 with Flying First Rank and Life Link, but hopefully we can uh, back up onto another creature to give it a plus one counter, and then those same abilities to get in right away, gain some life back, and then we still have a 4-4 with Flying First Rank and Life Link back on defense. So yeah, this is easily an A, definitely a bomb. Then we've got the Golden Scale Aeronauts, which is kind of the budget version of the Valkyrie. 5 mana, 2-3 Dwarf Pilot at common with backup 1 and just flying. So still pretty decent in an aggressive backup deck, but we are paying 5 mana for only 3-4 worth of stats. So it's not the best rate, so I'll give it a C. Then there's the Infected Defector, 5 mana, 4-3 Phyrexian Knight at common, and when it dies, Incubate 3. So 4-3, four, 4-5... A little bit overpriced, but if it dies we are left with potentially a 3-3 after we invest two more mana into it. So it's not bad, another decent curve topper, we'll give it a C. And then Knight Errant of Eos is a 5 mana, 4-4 four, four human knight at rare, has Convoke, and when the Knight Errant enters the battlefield, look at the top six cards of our library, and then we may reveal up to two creature cards with mana value X or less, from among them, where X is the number of creatures that convoked Knight Errand, and then put those cards into our hand. So let's say we play the Knight Errand, tapping three creatures, then now we can reveal two creatures in the top six that have mana value three or less. So that's probably what we're aiming for. If we only uh, convoked using two creatures, we only get to find one or two drops. So that's not too exciting. So definitely the more creatures we can tap, the better. And then of course a 4-4 creature that can also potentially stabilize us while we tap the rest of our team. So a nice source of card advantage, we'll give it a B. But uh, going to be at its best in a more dedicated creature deck that has lots of creatures for us to find. Then there's Sunfall, 5 mana sorcery at a rare. And this is one of the sweepers in the set. Exile all creatures. Incubate X, where X is the number of creatures exiled this way. So if we have lots of creatures out, then we can potentially make a huge Phyrexian afterwards. So this is a perfect sweeper, since not only does it reset the board, but it also gives us immediate board presence. 
to start pressuring the opponent on the following turn. So yeah, this is an easy A level bomb. Then there's the Alabaster Host Intercessor, a 6 mana, 3-4 Frexian Samurai at common. And this is going to be a whole cycle of commons with a basic land cycling ability. In this case, plane cycling for 2 mana, so we can discard the Alabaster from our hand to search our library for a planes card, reveal it and put it into our hand. So in the early game, if we're struggling to hit our land drops, we can just get a planes. And then in the late game, it's a 6 mana 3-4 when it enters the battlefield, exile target creature and opponent controls until the Alabaster leaves the battlefield. It's a pretty powerful removal effect, especially for a common. And once again, we have that flexibility of plane cycling early. And there are a few cards, especially in black-white, to maybe get it back from the graveyard later too, if we happen to cycle it. So, tempted to give this a B, and this will challenge the uh, two-mana pacifism as the best white common in the set. But for now, let's continue with blue, starting with Captive Weird. One mana, one three weird at uncommon, has defender, so can play it early to maybe protect some battles. And then later we can transform it for three and a Phyrexian red mana. And then it transforms into Completed Conjurer, which is a 3-3. Says when this creature transforms into the Conjurer, exile the top card of your library. Until the end of your next turn, you may play that card. So it provides a tiny bit of card advantage. And uh, yeah, we could already transform the Weird on turn 3 and start attacking with it. So not a bad effect. And will fit perfectly in the Blue Rats Convoke deck as a cheap creature we can play to then later help discount our other spells. So easily gets a C+, might even verge into the B grade. Then we have Omen Hawker, a 1 mana 1-1 one, one Cephalid Advisor at Uncommon, can tap, adding Colorless and Blue to our mana pool, but we can only spend this mana to activate abilities. But there's a lot of ways to spend mana here with the Hawker between transforming our creatures, like the weird we just covered. We could transform our incubator tokens into Phyrexians, and there may be some other activated abilities we can activate as well. So, not a bad card in the right deck where we have a sufficient number of abilities. So this is probably going to be much better in a blue-green deck, where we're going to have more creatures that transform as opposed to blue-red. But even in blue-red, it could still be serviceable as a cheap creature to help with Convoke. So I'll end up with a, a C on the Hawker. Don't overestimate it, but at the same time, could give you a huge mana advantage over the course of a game. Assimilate Essence is the Essence Scatter of the set. A 2-mana instant at common, counter target creature or battle spell, unless its controller pays 4 mana. If they do we still get to incubate two at the very least. So in the late game, it's still not a totally dead card, as we still maybe get a 2-2 out of it. So pretty good counter spell overall, as it also counters battles. So it's a bit more versatile than just countering creature spells. So this one will give a C plus. Two mana is not too difficult to keep up. So I typically like the counter spells that hit creatures a lot more than the ones that only hit non-creature spells. So we'll give Assimilate a C+. Change the Equation is part of the uh, Color Hoser cycle. 2 mana instant at Uncommon. Choose 1. Counter target spell with mana value 2 or less, which is incredibly narrow. Or we can counter target a red or green spell with mana value 6 or less. Still not a huge fan of this. Um, kind of a narrow sideboard card maybe if you're up against a red or green deck. So we'll give this a D similar to the white collar hoser. Next is Disturbing Conversion, a 2 mana enchantment aura at common with flash, and it enchants a creature. When it enters, each player mills 2 cards, and the enchanted creature gets minus x minus o, where x is the number of cards in its controller's graveyard. So this will be at its best in a blue-black Graveyard Matters deck, where we want to fill the graveyards up. Still not the most impressive removal spell, so I'm going to give this one a D as well. In a very dedicated blue-black deck, I could see this making the cut. Then Expedition Lookout is a 2-mana two 2-3 two Merfolk Rogue at common with Defender. Says as long as an opponent has 8 or more cards in their graveyard, 
the lookout can attack us though it didn't have defender and it cannot be blocked so if it does get to that point it's not bad but eight cards in graveyard despite all the milling that we might get in blue and black is still not going to be trivial so just looking at all the blue and black cards that support the mill archetype if you will i wasn't overly impressed so i'm going to give this one a d as well then there's a fairy mastermind a two mana two one fairy rogue at rare with flash and flying and says whenever an opponent draws their second card each turn we get to draw a card and for four mana each player draws a card so the idea is to activate the ability during the opponent's turn in which case we'll get to draw two cards and the opponent only gets to draw one so pretty powerful ability and staple onto a two mana two one flyer so not a bad deal easily gets a b moment of truth is a two mana instant at common and this is your typical cantrip effect look at the top three cards of our library one of those we can put into our hand the other one into our graveyard and one on the bottom of our library potentially a, a role player in the blue red spells matter decks where you want to have some ways to maybe enable prowess for instance and then you'll be happy to have a cantrip that can make that happen for you but uh, outside of those decks where you really want to enable some other synergies it's not a high priority card necessarily so we'll give this a C. Next is Negate. Two mana instant can counter target non-creature spell. And uh, yeah, we've seen this one before. Typically not a card I need to prioritize in draft. You may end up playing one of them and it could be fine. Countering a key removal spell. Or now we can counter battles as well. I would not go out of my way to take it highly. And I would also not play too many of them in my deck. So it gets a C. Next is Oracle of Tragedy. 2 mana human wizard at uncommon is a 1-3. When it enters a battlefield or dies, choose one. We get to draw a card and then discard. Or we can shuffle up to 4 target cards with mana value 3 or greater from our graveyard into our library. So, pretty interesting ability uh, in the late game, maybe in a self mill deck. It can be a way to prevent decking by putting a few cards back into our deck. Still not a very impressive card, still just a 2 mana 1-3 with a bit of marginal upside, so just a C. Order of the Mirror is another creature that can transform 2 mana 2-1 two human knight at common, and then for 3 and the Phyrexian white mana it can transform into Order of the Alabaster Host, which is a 3-3 three, three. when the host becomes blocked by a creature, that creature gets minus one minus one until end of turn can potentially transform it as early as turn three and attack with it even though it's going to cost us a bit of life just a fine curve filler for the knight decks especially so we'll give this a c then there's rona herald of invasion two mana one three a legendary human wizard at rare says whenever we cast a legendary spell untap rona and then we can tap to draw a card and then discard a card so it's a nice loot effect and if we can string together a few legendaries, we can use the ability multiple times. And then we can also transform Arona for 5 and a black Phyrexian mana into a 5-5. Five five. Arona Tolarian Obliterator has Trample. And whenever a source deals damage to Arona, that source's controller exiles a card from their hand at random. If it's a land card, we may put it onto the battlefield under our control. Otherwise, we may cast it without paying its mana cost. So not quite as powerful as Phyrexian Obliterator, but still does something very similar. So this one gets a B. Does take a bit of work to transform Morona, but in the meantime it can provide a good bit of card selection. And then a 5-5 five five Trample that the opponent's not going to want to block is also quite powerful. Next is Saiba Cryptomancer, 2 mana, 01 Moonfolk Ninja at common with Flash and Backup 1 and Hexproof. So this can be a great way to protect a key creature from removal by putting a plus one counter on it and then giving Hexproof until end of turn. And uh, probably won't be trying to play this as a two mana one two very often. So yeah, useful card to protect one of our key creatures. Give this a C, not a card I want to play too many copies of, but as a one off it could potentially catch the opponent off guard. Next is Skyclave Aerialist, 2 mana, 2-1 two Merfolk Scout at Uncommon, has flying, so 2 mana, 2-powered two Flyer is always playable. 
And then we can also transform it for four and a green Fraxian into a Skyclave Invader, which still only has two power, but gets a bit of extra toughness, turning into a 2-4. And when this creature transforms, we get to look at the top card of our library. If it's a land, put it on the battlefield. If we don't put it onto the battlefield, we can put it into our hand instead. So we can essentially draw a card, which is not bad. Even though we don't increase its power, it's still a nice mana sink to have access to. And blue-green supports kind of the transform theme. So there may be other synergies with transforming our flyer here. So it gets a C+. Plus. Next is Stasis Field. Two mana, Aura can enchant an opposing creature, turning it into an O2 creature with Defender, and it also loses all other abilities. Typically I'm not a huge fan of these types of removal spells, since the O2 Defender can actually still come in handy for the opponent. They can maybe sacrifice it, they can chum block with it, they can maybe flicker their creature to get it back. So it's not quite as... Uh, effective as your typical removal spells, so I'm hesitant to give it a very high grade. But in a pinch, if your deck doesn't have any other removal spells, this might do the trick. So I'll give this a C. Next is the Shapecraft, a 2-mana instant. Says target creature has base power and toughness for 3 until end of turn, and we get to draw a card. Definitely an effect we've seen before. This one's pretty cheap, but also doesn't make our creature all that enormous. Just a 4-3 will often still trade for opposing creatures. But uh, yeah, we also get to draw cards, so it replaces itself. So I can certainly see uh, moments where this will come in handy, maybe to help finish off a battle or to set up an ambush. So a playable card, but I wouldn't overdo it either. If you have too many of these, it may be difficult to set it up properly. So we'll give it a C. Next is Chrome Host Sea Shark, a 3 mana 2 4 Phyrexian Shark at rare, has flying. And says whenever we cast a non-creature spell, incubate X, where X is that spell's mana value. So the Sea Shark doesn't really ask much of us, just play it. As a 2-4 flyer, it's not bad, can attack and block. And then over time, hopefully we can cast a few non-creature spells and start incubating. And that will slowly take over the board, as we can spend the mana to activate the incubator tokens into Phyrexians. So this seems like a bomb to me, even if the opponent has removal for it, they actually have to put it in the graveyard. A pacifism effect is not going to be good enough, since we'll still be able to make more tokens with it. So this is a bomb. And next is Epharos Dispersal, a 3 mana instant at common. Cost 2 generic, less to cast if it targets an attacking creature, and says return target creature to its owner's hands, and we get to surveil 2. So Surveil is definitely back on the menu, gives us a bit of card selection, a way to maybe fill the graveyard as well. And Dispersal will often be able to cast for just a single blue mana, making it a very cheap answer, especially good at answering opposing incubator tokens once transformed into Phyrexians. So this one gets a C+. Then we have Eyes of Gitaxius, a 3 mana sorcery at common. Let's us incubate 3 and we get to draw a card. So it replaces itself, and will eventually turn into a 3-3 creature, even though it does take an extra investment. Still pretty good. Give it a C+. Then there's a Furtive Analyst, a 3-mana 1-4 Human Wizard at common with Vigilance. Can pay 2-mana, tap it, draw a card, and then discard a card. So it's your typical looter, but it does cost 2-mana to activate, which is a bit pricey. 1-4 uh, Vigilance in the meantime does play defense pretty well. So overall, playable card, but not a card I'm particularly excited about. Give it a C. Next there's Invasion of Segovia, a 3-mana rare battle. Has 4 defense counters, and when it enters we get to create 2 1-1 blue kraken creature tokens with Trample. So not the most impressive card for 3-mana, but it is quite useful, especially in the blue-red Convoke decks, getting to make multiple bodies. And then once we do get to defeat the battle, we get the Sea Tyrant of Segovia, a 3-3 Legendary Serpent, saying non-creature spells we cast have Convoke. And then at the beginning of our end step, untap up to four target creatures, so we can potentially use those creatures to Convoke, and then untap to maybe Convoke again. So we'll give this a C plus overall. Not the most impressive rare, but especially in blue-red, it should be quite serviceable. 
Next up is the Preening Champion. 3 mana, 2-2 two, two Bird Knight at common, has flying, and when it enters a battlefield, create a 1-1 one, one blue and red elemental creature token. So I think this one's actually going to end up being one of the better blue commons. 2-2 two, two Flyer for 3, we're pretty used to seeing by now, not a very impressive card. But getting to make that extra 1-1 one, one token is incredibly impactful, especially for the blue-red Convoke decks. So I'm going to give this a B, might be a little bit high for this 3-mana uh, common. Definitely on the low end of the B grade, but I think it's going to play out incredibly well, especially in blue-red. Next is the Xerix Strobe Knight. 3 mana, 2-2 two, two Human Knight at Uncommon with Flying and Vigilance. And we can tap it, create a 2-2 two, two White and Blue Knight creature token with Vigilance. But we can only activate this if we've cast 2 or more spells this turn. Which is not always all that easy to set up, since there's not a ton of cheap cantrips in the set necessarily. But yeah, this could be very powerful in Blue-White Knights, where we have a low curve. In blue rats spells we could also have a few cantrips to make it easier to double spell so this one also gets a B. Then there's Invasion of Kamigawa, 4 mana uncommon battle, 4 defense counters and when it enters a battlefield tap target artifact or creature an opponent controls and put a stun counter on it so stun counters are back saying if a permanent with a stun counter would become untapped, remove one of those stun counters from it instead. So you can keep an opposing permanent tapped down for a few extra turns potentially. And then if we can defeat the battle, we get the Rooftop Saboteurs, a 2-3 ninja with flying, and when it deals combat damage to a player or battle, we get to draw a card. So this is one of the better transformed battles we can get, especially in a deck that has some nice tempo tools to bounce opposing creatures and keep attacking. This will quickly take over the game, so give this a C+. Next is Invasion of Vryn, 4 mana, uncommon battle, 4 defense counters, and when it enters we get to draw 3 and then discard a card. So it does net us additional cards overall. And then if we manage to defeat it, so we get the overloaded mage ring, an artifact that for 1 mana we can tap and sacrifice to copy target spell we control. So we can double up on one of our next spells which could also be quite powerful. So yeah, C+, as a baseline, gives us a bit of card selection and card advantage. And then if we do manage to transform it, could also double dip on maybe one of our removal spells. Then there's Meeting of Minds, 4 mana instant at common, Convoke, and draw 2 cards. So pretty straightforward, but it being an instant, and of course playing very well with any token generators, makes this a pretty decent card overall, and I'm going to give it a C plus as well. It's going to play quite well in multiples, especially in a deck that's focused on enabling Convoke. So blue-red, of course, is going to be the best home for it. But could also play quite well in the blue-white Knights deck with a Vigilant Knight that can attack and then still tap for Convoke. Then there's the Oculus Whelp for mana 3-2 Frexen Dragon at common. It flies. As long as we control a transformed permanent, the whelp says when it dies we get to draw a card. Not the most impressive ability since it's going to be somewhat tricky to set up. 4 mana 3-2 flyer isn't bad, but I just don't count on uh, the whelp drawing a card very often. So I think it's still just a C at the end of the day. But in the more dedicated blue-green decks this might go up in value. Then there's Protocol Knight, 4 mana, 3-4 Human Knight at common, and when it enters the battlefield we can tap target creature and opponent controls, and we can also put a stun counter on that creature if we control another knight. So gonna be at its best in blue-white knights, and in the deck this could be a great tempo play, reminds me of Berg Strider from uh, Kaldheim, which ended up being one of the better blue commons, so this seems very powerful indeed, give it a C+. And then there's C double, 4 mana instant at rare, cannot be copied, and then we get to choose one. If an opponent has 8 or more cards in their graveyard, choose both instead. And we can either copy target spell, choose new targets for the copy, or create a token that's a copy of target creature. So if we get to choose both in the late game, this could be very powerful. Otherwise it could still be pretty decent getting to copy a creature at instant speed for 4 mana, can potentially set up a nice ambush. 
so at the very least the B. Then there's Temporal Cleansing for mana Sorcery at common with Convoke, and then the owner of target Nonland Permanent puts it into their library second from the top or on the bottom. Decent removal spell. If we bounce an opposing creature back, then it also eats away a draw step from the opponent, so we're still equal on card advantage pretty much. And in a nice blue-red tempo deck with lots of cheap tokens to enable Convoke, this could be an excellent removal spell. So I'll give it a C+. Next is Transcendent Message. X and Quadruple Blue for an instant at rare with Convoke. And we simply get to draw X cards. So this one's not going to be the easiest to enable. In the late game it could be very powerful of course. But uh, yeah, Quadruple Blue and X means it's not a card we're going to cast until very late into the game. Even in the more dedicated Convoke decks, it might take a while to set up. So I'm hesitant to give it an incredibly high grade, so I'll just go with a C. Then there's a Wicked Slumber 4 mana instant, has Convoke, is an uncommon, and says tap up to two target creatures, and then put a stun counter on either one of them, and then put another stun counter on either one of them. So basically means we can potentially put two stun counters on a single creature, or we can split them up. So pretty nice tempo play, especially thanks to Convoke and it being an instant. Can play this in the opponent's beginning of combat step, tap down their two biggest creatures before they get a chance to attack, and potentially lock down their biggest creature for two consecutive turns. So it's gonna take a very long time for the opponent before they can actually untap with it. So yeah, another one of those cards that can play very well in a blue-red spells deck with Convoke Synergy, or blue-white knights could also make great use of uh, Slumber alongside some Vigilant Knights. Gets a C+. Then there's Zephyr Singer, 4 mana, Siren Pirate at rare. It's a 3-4 with Convoke, has Flying and Vigilance, and when the Singer enters the battlefield, put a Flying Counter on each creature that Convoked it. So we can potentially give four creatures flying with the Singer if we tapped four different creatures. More realistically, maybe one or two. But even then, we still get a 3-4 with Flying and Vigilance, which is already quite good. We can potentially play this uh, on turn three realistically if we play the two or three drop. So gonna be quite powerful in pretty much any blue deck. And it doesn't take much for this to win you the game by giving your whole team evasion. So this seems like a bomb, we'll give it an A. And uh, yeah, keep in mind this one actually does place flying counters on your creatures, as opposed to Elspeth. So that's why the confusion with Elspeth might arise. Next is Astral Wingspan, 5 mana, Enchantment Aura and Uncommon, has Convoke. Enchant one of our creatures, giving it plus 2, plus 2 and flying. And more importantly, when it enters the battlefield we get to draw a card as well. So as long as we make sure this resolves successfully, we'll at least get a card back. And then plus two, plus two and flying is a pretty good way to close out the game, especially if we can put this on one of our larger creatures. So see this playing out quite well, give it a B. Historically I'm not a fan of auras, but auras that replace themselves are of course a lot better. Next is Corruption of Tawashi, a five mana enchantment at Uncommon. When it enters the battlefield we get to incubate four, and then whenever a permanent we control transforms, or a permanent enters the battlefield under our control transformed, we may draw a card, and only happens once each turn. So this will be at its best in blue-green, where we can transform some of our incubator tokens, we can maybe transform battles, as well as our various creatures that can turn into Phyrexians. So this will be great in that archetype, and then blue-green might also have a bit of ramp, so we can play this ahead of schedule. So I'll give this a B. Then there's Halo Charged Scab, 5 mana, 4-4 four, four zombie at common. When it enters the battlefield, each player mills two cards, and then we may put an instant sorcery or battle from our graveyard on top of our library. Decent filler card, especially in blue-black. Give it a C. Then there's Invasion of Arcavios, a 5 mana, rare battle, 7 defense counters, so not the easiest to transform. When it enters the battlefield, search your library, graveyard, and or outside the game for an instant or sorcery card. 
and then reveal it and put it into our hand. Now the wording might seem a bit confusing here, but only get to search for a single card. It's not like the ends implies that we get to search for two cards. And then what happens if we do manage to transform it? Then we get an enchantment, invocation of the founders, saying whenever we cast an instant or sorcery spell from our hand, we may copy that spell and choose new targets for the copy. So pretty powerful payoff. Yeah, five mana for a tutor is typically not where we want to be. So I'm going to give this a D. I don't think it's going to be quite worth it and limited. Then there's Jingataxius, five mana, legendary Frex Imperator at Mythic. It's a 5-5 five five with a bit of built-in protection, has a ward 2, and says whenever we cast a non-creature spell with mana value 3 or greater, we get to draw a card. Now the great thing about Jingataxius in this set is that a lot of cards have Convoke, and that will naturally increase their mana value, even though we can still play them for pretty cheap by tapping some of our creatures. So that definitely helps draw additional cards with Jin. And then we can pay 4 mana to transform Jin, but only if we have 7 or more cards in hand. So this one's going to be a lot trickier to transform as opposed to Elishnorn. Once we do get to transform Jin, then we can first draw cards equal to the number of cards in our hand. We have no maximum hand size. And then on the second chapter, we can return all non frexing creatures to their owner's hands. And eventually, we may cast any number of spells from our hand without paying their mana costs, and then transform it back into our Praetor. Powerful card. I don't expect to transform it very often, but even as just a creature, I think it's a bomb. We'll give it an A. Artistic Refusal, I'm not a huge fan of. 6 mana, uncommon instant with Convoke. Get to choose one or both, counter target spell, draw two cards, then discard a card. So as a counter spell, it's not going to be very easy to keep up. Even with Convoke, it's still going to require a lot of extra mana to keep up a 6 mana counter spell. And then draw two discard, I guess, is a nice upside. But uh, still not interested in playing a 6 mana counter spell. So we'll give it a D. And then complete the circuit, a 6 mana rare instant with Convoke saying we may cast sorcery spells this turn as though they had flash, and when we cast our next instant or sorcery spell this turn, copy that spell twice, and we may choose new targets for the copies. The issue with complete the circuit is we need a ton of mana to be able to cast it and cast another instant or sorcery alongside it, and if it has to be an impactful instant or sorcery, that's just gonna be way too much. Even in the more dedicated Convoke decks that can make lots of tokens, I don't really see this working out all that well. So yeah, I'm gonna give this a D. There might be decks out there that can use it successfully, but in general I would not advise prioritizing Complete the Circuit. Then there's Thunderhead Squadron, 6 mana, 3-4 Human Knight at common, has Convoke, and has Flying. So pretty solid role player in the blue-white knight deck, could be good in the blue-red convoke decks as well. So fine card, a bit expensive, but we still get some decent stats with flying, which is probably one of the better ways to pressure battles if we want to transform them. So we'll give it a C. And then a tidal terror is part of the basic line cycling creatures, 6 mana, 5, 6 octopus at common. And when the Terror attacks, we may tap two other untapped creatures we control. If we do, the Terror cannot be blocked this turn. And that also seems like an incredibly useful ability to finish off battles if we can make the Terror unblockable. So definitely like this one as well. Give it a C+. Okay, first black card. Corrupted Conviction, one mana instant. As an additional cost, sacrifice a creature and then draw two. So essentially a new village rights at common here and gets a C. Will potentially play well in the Black Rat Sacrifice deck. Although unfortunately we cannot sacrifice artifacts to Conviction, which would make it a lot better. Iker Drinker, 1 mana, 1-1 one, one Fraxin Vampire at common with a lifelink. And for a single black mana we can exile it from our graveyard to incubate 2 and only as a sorcery. I actually think the Drinker is going to be an important role player. First off, it's a Phyrexian that incubates, which is perfect for the black-white Phyrexian tribal deck. 
It also provides sacrifice fodder for the Black Rat Sacrifice deck, since we can first play Drinker, sacrifice it, and then make an Incubate token, which we can also maybe sacrifice. So I'm gonna give this a C plus overall. Can also maybe get some early damage in with Lifelink, which is always nice. Then Mirrodin Avenged, one mana for an instant at common, destroy target creature that was dealt damage this turn, and then draw a card. So another functional reprint from You're Already Dead, which ended up being a fine card, maybe a bit less powerful than people expected it to be, and then maybe also gets a little bit better now that battles are a thing, since it's easier to maybe justify attacking with a smaller creature into a large creature. If you're trying to finish off a battle, the opponent may not suspect you to have Muradin Avenged in hand, but uh, still just gonna give it a C. Then a Scorn Blade Berserker, 1 mana 01 Human Berserker at Uncommon with backup 1, and for 1 mana we can sacrifice this creature to draw a card. So there's a lot going on here. Let's say Berserker's the only creature we have, then it's a 1 mana 1-2, one, that for another 1 mana we can sacrifice to draw a card, but there are a lot of situations where we can maybe sacrifice another small creature and then still sacrifice Berserker after chumping with it and then uh, draw an extra card. So this should play incredibly well in the various sacrifice decks, but even outside of it I see this playing out quite nicely. Sacrifice a creature, have Berserker left over, chump with it, draw a card, and all for just one or two mana. So I'm gonna give this a C+. Then Aetherblade Agent is a 2 mana 1 1 human rogue at common with Death Touch, and for 4 and a blue Phyrexian can transform into a 3 3 with Death Touch, saying if it deals combat damage to a player or battle, we get to draw a card. Already a 2 mana 1 1 Death Touch seems quite good, and then being able to transform it to make it even better is just a cherry on top. Seems like an excellent common here, gets a C. Bladed's Battle Fan 2 mana equipment with Flash at common, and as we'll see in the set, there's a few equipment that immediately attach to a creature when we play them, and same with the Battle Fan, comes attached to a creature we control, and in this case that creature gains indestructible until end of turn, and it also gets plus 1 plus 0, and then equips for 1 mana afterwards. So pretty cheap to play, kind of functions as a combat trick, giving plus 1 plus 0 indestructible until end of turn, and then it's still a pretty useful equipment, giving an extra power. So definitely a fan of the battle fan, and gets a C+. Still have to play it in moderation, since I still kind of view it as a, a combat trick here, but as a 1 or 2 off it could be quite serviceable. Especially nice alongside death touch creatures. Black Reaper Thalad is a 2 mana 2-2 two, two fungus at uncommon, and transforms for 3 and a green Phyrexian into a Blight Sower Thalad, which is a 3-3, three, three, and when it transforms it also generates a 1-1 one, one green Phyrexian Sapperling creature token, and when it dies it generates another one of those 1-1 one, one tokens as well. So pretty decent card, makes lots of sacrifice fodder for potential sacrifice synergies, and just generally a good rate for a creature, so it gets a C+. Then there's a Drag Recycler, 2 mana 2-2 two, two Phyrexian Beast at common, can tap, sacrifice an artifact or creature, and then each opponent loses one life and we gain one life. So a fine creature to play early, and then in the late game, in the more dedicated sacrifice decks, it can maybe close out the game for us. So this one gets a C fine playable, but still not particularly exciting. Final Flourish is a 2 mana instant speed removal spell at common, giving minus 2 minus 2 until end of turn, unless we sacrificed an artifact or a creature to kick it, in which case it's minus 6 minus 6 until end of turn instead. So very solid removal spell, at the very least a C+, and in the more dedicated sacrifice decks that have a lot of sacrifice fodder, this will go up in value even more. Gift of Completion is a 2 mana enchantment at uncommon, and when it enters the battlefield, incubate 3, and it will stay in place, saying whenever a Phyrexian we control dies, we get to surveil 1. So that gives us a bit of card selection, will be perfect for any sacrifice deck, or especially good in the black-white Phyrexian tribal archetype. Gets a C+. 
Grafted Butcher is a 2 mana 2-2 two, two Phyrexian Samurai at rare, and it's a Lord for Phyrexians, giving them plus one plus one. And whenever the Butcher enters the battlefield, Phyrexians we control gain menace until end of turn as well. And then it even comes back from our graveyard. If we pay four mana, sacrifice an artifact or creature, it will return from our graveyard to the battlefield. So then it can potentially give menace once again. So yeah, seems quite powerful, gets a B, perfect for those Phyrexian tribal decks. Nezumi Informant is a 2 mana 1 1 rat rogue at common. When it enters a battlefield, each opponent discards a card. So we've seen this effect before, and it seems quite serviceable here as well. Plays quite nicely in the sacrifice decks as a creature we don't mind sacrificing after it's already provided value when entering the battlefield. Gets a C. Traumatic Revelation is a 2 mana discard spell at sorcery speed. It's a common saying, target opponent reveals their hand. We may choose a creature or battle card from it. If we do, that player discards that card. If we don't, we get to incubate 3 instead. So then we can later make a 3-3 three, three Phyrexian, which is not bad. Now we could also just take a look at the opponent's hand, and even though they might have a card we could make them discard, we can still decline to do so, and still make that Incubate 3 token. And at the same time, we also gained a lot of extra information, which is quite nice. And then, of course, in the late game, if the opponent is empty-handed, at the very least, we still get to make a 3-3 three, three token. So not bad uh, for a discard spell. Still probably just a C, but uh, definitely one of the better discard spells we've seen in recent memory. Cannot take away removal spells that the opponent might have, it's just limited to creatures and battles, but uh, still very serviceable. Then we have Ayara, Widow of the Realm, 1 and double black for a 3-3 legendary elf noble at rare. Can tap and sacrifice another creature or artifact, and then Ayara deals X damage to target opponent or battle, and we gain X life where X is the sacrificed permanent's mana value. So, probably don't want to be sacrificing tokens with it. And then we can also transform Ayara for 5 and a red Phyrexian mana into Ayara Furnace Queen, a 4 4, saying at the beginning of combat on our turn, return up to one target artifact or creature from our graveyard to the battlefield. It gains haste, and then we have to exile it at the beginning of our next end step. So we better make it count. Still, overall, a powerful card, and we'll give it a B. Then there's Bloated Processor, a 3 mana, 3 2 Phyrexian. Can sacrifice another Phyrexian to put a plus one plus one counter on the processor. And when the processor dies, incubate X, where X is its power. So it will replace itself, can sacrifice as many Phyrexians as we want to it, which is pretty useful, and will play quite nicely in the sacrifice decks, whether it's black red or black green. And of course also Phyrexian for the black-white Phyrexian tribal deck. So it has a lot of great overlap, making it a great rare to slot into a lot of different decks, even if it's not obscenely powerful, still at the very least a B. Then there's Collective Nightmare, 3 mana instant at uncommon with Convoke. It says target creature gets minus 3 minus 3 until end of turn. So a great removal spell can potentially shrink something down and then finish it off by blocking it, can block a creature with some of our creatures and then tap those same creatures to cast Nightmare with Convoke. So there's a lot of ways to use it successfully and uh, yeah, Convoke makes all our cards better and same here. So Nightmare gets a B, great removal spell. Completed Huntmasters, a 3 mana Phyrexian Alpha Warrior at Uncommon, it's a 2-3 and can pay one mana, tap, sacrifice another creature artifact to incubate three. So hopefully we can upgrade some of our smaller creatures. And uh, yeah, this will work out quite nicely in a lot of different decks. So it gets a C plus. Etched Familiar is a three mana, three two Phyrexian Fox, also an artifact creature. And when it dies, each opponent loses two life and we gain two life. And the flavor text, no refunds. This one seems playable, but not exciting. Give it a C. Flitting Gorilla is a 3 mana Fairy Rogue, 2-2 two, two Flyer, and when it dies, each player mills 2 cards. 
then we may exile the gorilla from our graveyard and if we do put target creature or battle card from our graveyard on top of our library not bad um gives us a bit of recursion still just a three mana two two flyer for the most part give those a c typically unless there's major upside and this one still seems kind of marginal then there's a glistening deluge which is part of the hate cycle a three mana uncommon sorcery all creatures get minus one minus one until end of turn creatures that are green and or white get an additional minus two minus two until end of turn so potentially minus three minus three for green and white creatures which can be quite powerful in the right matchup but uh, i would be avoiding this in my main deck but will make for an excellent sideboard card give it a d overall as a card i would not recommend main decking then we have Iker Shade, 3 mana, 2, 3, Frexian Shade at common, saying at the beginning of your end step, if an artifact or creature was put into a graveyard from the battlefield this turn, put a plus one plus one counter on it. Yeah, fine playable, especially good in the sacrifice decks, nothing exciting, gets a C. A render Inert is next, a 3 mana sorcery at uncommon, says remove up to 5 counters from target permanent and draw a card. This one's pretty tricky, since of course the obvious use case is to remove counters from a battle to help transform it. Now the problem is, your decks probably aren't going to have a ton of battles to begin with, since you have to treat them as your non-creature spells, which are a way to round out your deck, which is still mainly consisting of creatures. So you might have maybe two or three battles, unless you're a battle tribal deck, in which case you might have a few more. But black isn't known to have a ton of battle synergy. So let's say you do have three battles in your deck, which is probably on the high side. Then even so, you may not draw your battles before drawing Render Inert. And then it's not going to be all that exciting. We can also potentially use it to take out opposing Phyrexians that the opponent has transformed. So there are still use cases outside of transforming battles. It's a fine card. Um... I would be hesitant to rate it too highly unless you're really kind of a battle synergy deck in which case of course this will go up in value quite a bit so i'm gonna give it a c overall next is unseal the necropolis three mana instance and then each player mills three cards then we return up to two creature cards from our graveyard to our hand so we've often seen these effects before and they're usually quite good Happy to have at least one of these in almost all my black decks. And then getting to mill 3 also helps enable it if there's maybe only one to begin with. So, gets a C+. Vanquish the Weak is reprinted and has always been quite powerful. 3 mana instant. Destroy target creature with power 3 or less at common. So, excellent removal spell. One of the better black commons gets a B. Consuming Aetherborn is a 4 mana 2 to Aetherborn Vampire at common with backup 1 and a lifelink. So it could end up as a 3 3 lifelink. Better use case is probably to give something in play lifelink for a turn and get a nice attack in. And then we'll be left with a 2 2 lifelink, which is not exciting but still serviceable. So this one gets a C. Deadly Derision, 4 mana instant at common, destroy target creature or planeswalker and create a treasure token. So this might be the actual best common, but uh, certainly close in power level with Vanquish the Weak. Gets a B. Then we get another battle. Invasion of Eldraine, four mana, uncommon, four defense counters, and when it enters, target opponent discards two cards. So a bit overpriced as far as uh, Mind Rot effects go, typically costs three mana. This one costs four. And then if we manage to transform it, we get the fairies, a 2-2 flying, saying at the beginning of each opponent's upkeep, if that player has two or fewer cards in hand, fairies deal two damage to them. So it's a pretty solid finisher once the opponent's close to empty-handed. But I'm not a huge fan of the base for mana to discard two. Seems a bit expensive, so we'll give it a C overall. Next is Invasion of Innistrad. This one's a bit more exciting. A 4-mana Mythic Rare Battle with Flash, so we can play it at instant speed. 
And when it enters a battlefield, target creature the opponent controls gets minus 13, minus 13 until end of turn. And then five defense counters. But if we transform it, we do get some pretty nice value. Deluge of the Dead is an enchantment. And when it enters a battlefield, creates two black zombie creature tokens. So a pair of 2-2 two -two zombies. And then for two and a black, exile target card from a graveyard. If it was a creature card, we get to make another 2-2 two -two zombie token. So that can quickly take over the game once we manage to transform it. And as a baseline, it's a great removal spell as well. So definitely on the high end of B, maybe A-, minus, but a very good indeed. Nazumi Freewheeler is a 4-mana Red Samurai at Uncommon, has Menace on a 3-3. And when it enters the battlefield, each player mills 3 cards. So it can be useful in enabling some of those graveyard synergies. And we'll also enable this uh, creature itself, as we'll see in a second, because for 5 and a white Phyrexian mana, we can transform Freewheeler into Hideous Flesh Wheeler, which is a 4-5 Phyrexian rat with menace. And when this creature transforms, we can put target permanent card with mana value 2 or less from a graveyard onto the battlefield under our control. So that also includes the opponent's graveyard. So yeah, generates a nice bit of value if we transform it, and then a 4-5 Menace also beats down pretty hard, so easily a C+. Pylon, 4 mana, rare removal spell. It's an instant with Convoke, destroying target creature or planeswalker, and we get to surveil 2. So yeah, about as efficient as a removal spell is going to get. Another easy B on the high end of B. Tenured Oilcaster is a 4-mana 2-4 Phyrexian Wizard at common with Menace and gets plus 3 plus 0 as long as an opponent has 8 or more cards in their graveyard. So this is another one of those payoff cards that you want to play in blue-black, presumably. And whenever the Oilcaster attacks or blocks, each player mills a card. So it eventually enables itself, but it does take a while to get going. And uh, yeah, 2-4 Menace for 4, playable, not exciting. So I'm going to rate it a C overall, but in a very dedicated blue-black deck, it will go up in value. Then Archpriest of Shadows, a 5-mana 4-4 Human Warlock at rare, with backup 1, and has a Death Touch. And whenever this creature deals damage to a player or battle, return target creature card from our graveyard to the battlefield. So an incredibly powerful effect if we can set it up right, hopefully can back up onto maybe an evasive creature, making it easier to hit the opponent and reanimate. And then we're still left with a big death toucher. So this card seems very powerful and gets an A bomb level card for sure. Etched Host Doombringer has a 5 mana 3-5 Phyrexian Demon at common. When it enters a battlefield, choose one. Either target opponent loses 2 life and we gain 2 life, or we can choose a battle if an opponent protects it, remove three defense counters from it. Otherwise, put three defense counters on it. So, not bad for a five mana creature, a three five. Maybe a bit on the uh, weak side for five mana, but it still blocks quite well. Especially when trying to set up some double blocks. It has a lot of toughness. And then uh, can drain the opponent or help you take out or protect battles. So it's a playable card, good uh, top end card to maybe finish out your curve, gets a C. Failed Conversion, a 5 mana enchantment aura at common, enchanting a creature, giving it minus 4, minus 4. And then if the enchanted creature were to die, we get to surveil 2. So this one, I kind of went back and forth between a C and a C+. On the one hand, 5 mana is kind of expensive for a removal spell that only gives minus 4, minus 4, and doesn't outright destroy the creature. But minus 4, minus 4 is usually still enough to take out most creatures in the format. And then uh, getting to surveil 2 afterwards is actually quite impactful, because by the time you have 5 mana, you probably don't want to draw a ton of lands anymore. So surveil 2 becomes even more valuable at that stage in the game. So I ended up giving this a C+. Invasion of Ulgrotha is a 5 mana battle at Uncommon, 5 defense counters. When it enters a battlefield, it deals 3 damage to any other target, and we gain 3 life. So this can also help transform a battle that the opponent is protecting, which is quite nice. Still a bit overcosted, 5 mana for 3 damage and 3 life. 
typically see this effects going for four mana sometimes of course even cheaper if you're talking multicolor cards but uh, yeah a bit overpriced at five mana and then five defense counters also not the easiest to transform but once we do we get the grand mother ravi sanger which is a three three flyer saying whenever a creature an opponent controls dies put a plus one plus one counter on it and we gain one life so a decent payoff for transforming it gets a c just because it's a bit overpriced to get the three damage and three life then we have Shieldred, 5 mana, 4 5, a legendary Phyrexian Praetor at Mythic, has a menace, and when it enters a battlefield, each opponent sacrifices a non token creature or planeswalker. So it already makes quite the entrance. And then 4 in a black, exile Shieldred and transform it, but only if an opponent has 8 or more cards in their graveyard. So, once again, not the easiest of the Praetors to transform, but it is still quite realistic, unlike Jingitaxius, which requires seven cards in hand. I expect to transform Shieldred pretty often. And then once we do, we start out saying, for each opponent, destroy up to one target creature or planeswalker that player controls. Then each opponent discards three cards, and then mills three cards. And finally, put all creature cards from all graveyards onto the battlefield under your control. And transform it back into Shieldred. So yeah, this is an absolute S tier level bomb, even though it may be somewhat tricky to transform Shieldred, once you do it's probably game over. So that gets an S. Next is Invasion of Fiora, another bomb level card. Six mana battle at rare, four defense counters, and when it enters the battlefield choose one or both, destroy all legendary creatures, and destroy all non-legendary creatures. So there are situations where you might be the only one controlling legendaries or non-legendaries, and this could be a nice one-sided sweeper. But even if it's not, it's still a great way to reset the entire board, since you can choose all two modes. And then if you ever get to take out the battle, you get Marquisa, Resolute Monarch, a 3-6, with Menace and Death Touch, and when this creature attacks, remove all counters from up to one target permanent. So that can also help you finish off future battles. And at the beginning of your upkeep, if you haven't been dealt combat damage since your last turn, you draw a card and lose one life. So it can be a nice card draw engine on top of that. So yeah, this is an absolute bomb. Definitely an A, verging on an S as well. But uh, you will need to have some creatures to eventually transform the battle to get the most out of it. But even the sweeper by itself is incredibly powerful. Then a Merciless repurposing is a 6 mana uncommon instant. Exiling target creature and we get to incubate 3. So a bit expensive for removal but we do get some board presence with it as well. Which will come in handy. So gonna give this a C+. Phyrexian Gargantua is back, 6 mana, 4-4 four, four at Uncommon. When it enters, draw 2 cards and lose 2 life. So a very nice source of card advantage while still putting a creature on the battlefield. Seems quite powerful, give it a B. Then a Breach of the Multiverse, a 7 mana rare sorcery, saying each player mills 10 cards. For each player, choose a creature or planeswalker in that player's graveyard and then put those cards onto the battlefield under your control, and then each creature you control also becomes a Phyrexian in addition to its other types. So a bit expensive at 7 mana, you're not guaranteed to necessarily get back a ton of great creatures from the graveyard, so I'm a bit hesitant to give this a high grade, even in the dedicated Phyrexian tribal deck, where the extra creature type will be a nice bonus, it still doesn't seem like a bomb to me, so I'll just give it a C, a bit expensive and may not necessarily reward you for it. Then a Gloomfang Mauler is part of the basic land cyclers. 7 mana, 5-5 five, five with backup 2 and menace, and swamp cycling for 2 mana. Yeah, backup 2 is nice, and getting menace on top of that can potentially allow a creature to set up a profitable attack, and then you still have a 5-5 five, five menace left over, or you could end up with a 7-7 seven, seven menace, which isn't bad either. So this one gets a C plus as well. And then last but not least, Hoarding, Brute Lord, 8 mana, 7-6, Dragonet Rare with Convoke and Flying. 
So luckily Convoke will make it realistic to cast. And then when it enters the battlefield, search your library for a card, exile it face down and then shuffle. For as long as that card remains exiled, you may play it. And spells you cast from exile also have Convoke. So you just need to play some creatures and then ramp out the Broodlord and it will take care of the rest, finding your best cards. And then a 7-6 flyer can also close out the game in a hurry. Makes it trivial to finish off battles as well. So this seems like another bomb and gets an A. First red card is Aki. Scrap Chomper, 1 mana, 1-1 one, one Frex and Goblin at common. 1 in red to tap, sacrifice an artifact or land and draw a card. So it could be a fine like mana sink in the sacrifice decks. But as a baseline, seems a bit weak, so give this one a D. Then a Beamtown Beatstick is a 1 mana equipment. Equips for 2 mana, giving plus 1 plus 0 and menace. And whenever the equipped creature deals combat damage to a player or battle, we get to create a treasure token. So a pretty decent card, can potentially help us generate mana, even fix our mana in some cases. And menace as well as extra power is not a bad rate. Similar to the Halberd in white, seems like a pretty powerful equipment. Not going to prioritize it necessarily, unless our deck has some great equipment synergies that we need to exploit. But uh, as a one or two off in my aggressive decks, it should be quite decent. So we'll give it a C. Next is Coming in Hot, so one mana instant at common. Can give a creature plus one plus so and first strike until end of turn, and then we get to scry one as well. So as far as comma tricks go, this one's not often going to help us trade a smaller creature and uh, trade the comma trick for a larger creature since it's only giving one extra power. So unless we're pairing it with a death touch creature, it's often only going to help us trade for a creature that's about the same size as the creature we're targeting. So it's not the best there, um, despite only being one mana, which is easier to keep up than some of the two mana tricks. So I'm going to give this one a D. I think we can do better as far as tricks are concerned. But there might be some aggressive decks that are still happy just having a cheap trick like this one. Barrage is a 1 mana sorcery at uncommon. And Barrage cannot be countered. Deals 1 damage to a creature or planeswalker. Or 5 damage instead if that uh, target is white and or blue. Another part of the uh, hate cycle that we've seen before. Not particularly exciting to main deck, but could be an excellent sideboard card. So I'm going to give this a D as well. So Red's not off to the best start. Next is Mirren Bane Splitter, a 1 mana equipment with Flash, giving plus 2 plus 0. And when this enters, we can attach it to a creature right away. So this is a pretty nice equipment. And then cost 3 mana to move afterwards. But uh, yeah, very cheap to play. Don't have to pay the initial equip cost. So pretty decent equipment, similar to the beat stick, it gets a C. Then there's a Blood Feather Phoenix, a 2 mana rare Phoenix, a 2 2 flyer, and cannot block, so that's the main drawback. So I want to play this in a more aggressive deck, hopefully. And whenever an instant or sorcery spell we control deals damage to an opponent or battle, we can pay one red mana. If we do, return the phoenix from our graveyard to the battlefield, and it also gains haste until end of turn. So not bad if we can enable it from the graveyard, um, but it does need to be played in a pretty aggressive deck that doesn't mind the drawback of not blocking, which isn't always the case. So probably going to be better in like an aggressive red-white deck compared to a more controlling blue-red deck. Even though blue red is probably the place where we're most likely to get it back from the graveyard, since we're probably going to have more burn spells. So overall, decent card, but not quite in the B tier, so we'll just go for C+. Then a Burning Sun's Fury has a 2 mana instant at common with Convoke, saying up to 2 target creatures each get plus 2 plus 0 and to gain haste until end of turn. So pretty interesting trick, getting to pump two different creatures, potentially even for free if we can tap two untapped creatures for Convoke, could be quite powerful. So gonna be at its best probably in blue-red, where we have lots of smaller creatures to set up our Convoke synergies. The haste is a little bit strange, since if we cast Burning Sun's Fury, play creature alongside it, and then 
want to give that creature haste, then there's the temptation to tap our summoning sick creature to help cast burning suns with convoke. But in this case, we need our summoning sick creature to actually get the benefit from haste. So there's a bit of tension there, but the versatility is still quite high since we can play this on both offense and defense. Convoke makes it easy to disguise, so I'm still a fan of it overall. Give it a C. Then a Furnace Gremlin is a 2-mana 1-2 Fraxin Gremlin at Uncommon. And we can pump it up for 1 under red, it gets 1 additional power until end of turn. And then when it dies, incubate X, where X is its power. So yeah, the threat of activation is always nice, gives us a mana sink in the late game, replaces itself, so we don't mind sacrificing it in our red-black sacrifice decks. Solid role player gets a C+. Next is Invasion of Mercadia, a 2-mana uncommon battle. When it enters the battlefield, we may discard a card if we do draw two cards, and then a four defense counters we need to conquer, and then transforms into the Flame Rite, a 3-3. Three, three. And for two and a red, we can tap it, discard a card to create two 1-1 one, one blue and red elemental creature tokens, and creatures we control get plus one plus zero and gain haste until end of turn. So there's a lot going on here. Uh, but yeah, overall, seems like a pretty solid package, good battle, and then if we transform it, we'll play quite well in the blue-red Convoke decks especially, gets a C+. Next is Invasion of Tarkir, 2-mana Mythic Rare Battle, has 5 defense counters, and then when it enters a battlefield, we can reveal any number of dragon cards from our hands. When we do, Invasion deals X plus 2 damage to any other target, where X is the number of cards revealed this way. So even if we don't have any dragons to reveal, it still deals 2 damage to any target, so reminiscent of a Bone Crusher Giant stomping for 2 damage first. And then if we manage to defeat the battle, we get a Defiant Thunder Maw, a 4-4 Flying Trample, saying whenever a dragon we control attacks, it deals 2 damage to any target. And of course, a dragon itself means we can deal damage when it attacks, so a very powerful creature if we transform it, and getting 2 damage for 2 mana is still a great deal, so easily a B. Next is Kenra Spellspear, 2 mana, 2-2 two, two, Jackal Warrior at Uncommon, has Trample and Prowess, and then we can transform it for 3 and a Fraxian blue mana, so it can potentially transform on turn 3 already, and then we get a 3-3 three, three with Trample, Ward 2, and then a double Prowess, don't think we've uh, seen double prowess before, but means we can potentially pump it twice if we cast a non-creature spell. And uh, yeah, this will hit incredibly hard, can get in there pretty early, has a bit of built-in protection. And then uh, if we can back this up with a few non-creature spells, the damage is going to pile on quickly. So this seems like one of the better transform creatures we've seen so far. Easily gets a B, and a pretty high B at that. Next is Pyretic Prankster, 2 mana, 2-1 two, Devil at common, and can transform for 3 and a Phyrexian Black mana, and then turns into a 3-2 Glistening Goremonger, which is a creature that when it dies, each opponent sacrifices an artifact or a creature. So, yeah, fine card. Not one of the more exciting transform cards, but certainly a role player will play nicely in the sacrifice decks, gets a C. And then a Rals Reinforcements is a 2-mana sorcery at common, creating two 1-1 one, one blue and red elemental creature tokens. This is exactly the type of card that you want to play early in your blue-red Convoke decks to enable all those more expensive Convoke cards. And then being a sorcery itself means it can also help with enabling prowess and other synergies. So I think this is one of the more important cards to pick up for those blue-red decks. And uh, I'm going to give it a C+, plus just because of how vital it is to start your curve with two tokens. Next is Thrashing Frontliner, 2 mana, 2-2 two, two, Vaishino Phyrexian at common with Trample. And when it attacks a battle, it gets plus 1 plus 1 until end of turn. So attacking as a 3-3 three, three Trample when attacking battles, not bad for a 2-drop. So this will play perfectly in the red-green battle tribal deck, if you will. So it gets a C, still just kind of a filler creature in most other decks. And as we've mentioned, still have to be hesitant to uh, play too many battles in your deck, since otherwise you risk 
not being able to finish them off. Next is a Trailblazing Historian, 2 mana 1-3 with haste, and can tap it to give another creature haste until end of turn. Definitely seen this effect before, often stapled onto a 1-drop, now we get it on a 2-drop that itself has haste. Yeah, being able to give haste to some larger creatures, especially green creatures, could be quite nice. Give it a C, not a card I would necessarily prioritize too much. Volcanic Spite is a 2 mana instant at common, dealing 3 damage to a creature, planeswalker or battle, and we may put a card from our hand on the bottom of our library if we do draw a card. So definitely a card we've seen before in Ikoria, now updated to also damage planeswalkers and battles, so got a significant upgrade. So yeah, definitely one of the best red commons in the set, and gets a B. Very efficient removal spell with a bit of card selection. Rent's Resolve is also a functional reprint from a Reckless Impulse. 2 mana sorcery at common, exile the top 2 cards of our library. Until the end of our next turn we may play those cards. So can be a nice source of card advantage. Gets better the later in the game we play it, as we'll have more mana to cast all the cards we exile with it. Can also play lands from exile, so when to wait to cast resolve before playing a land for the turn in case we exile two of them. So it gets a C plus, a nice two for one. Furnace Reigns is the one act of treason effect in the set. Uh, three mana sorcery at uncommon. Gain control of a creature until end of turn, untap that creature, and then it gets the additional ability if it deals combat damage to a player or battle, create a treasure token. So a nice little upgrade over your typical act of treason. But yeah, this is going to be one of your better cards in a red-black sacrifice deck, where you can steal an opposing creature and then maybe afterwards sacrifice it before handing it back. So this will be a C+, especially in the red-black archetype. Then Hanger Scrounger is a 3-mana Dwarf Pilot at common, a 2-1 with a backup 1, and it will grant the ability to the creature it's backing up. Whenever this creature becomes tapped, you may discard a card if you do draw a card. So a nice little bit of card selection. Now, once we back up another creature, we're going to be left with a 2-1 Scrounger, which is probably unlikely to have great attacks going forward. There's not a ton of vehicles in the set that we can crew with a Scrounger to still keep tapping it to get that card selection. So the Scrounger itself will need a little bit of help to keep looting, but uh, if we can keep enabling it, then it's going to provide a ton of extra card selection. So we'll get a C overall. Next is the Harried Artisan, a 3-mana 2-3 Artificer at Uncommon, has haste, and for 3 and a white Phyrexian, we can transform it into a 3-4 with flying and haste. So nice Phyrexian with flying here. And uh, yeah, seems like a fine C plus at least. Into the Fire is a 3 mana rare sorcery. Can choose one between dealing 2 damage to each creature, planeswalker and battle. Or we can put any number of cards from our hand on the bottom of our library. And then draw that many cards plus one. So similar to a Valakut Awakening. This also has the flexibility of being a sweeper for smaller stuff. So will be quite good in the decks that don't have a lot of small creatures themselves. So thinking of maybe a red-green deck, where we can also maybe use this to finish off a battle. Gets a C plus at the very least. Invasion of Regatha is a 3-mana uncommon battle, 5 defense counters, and when it enters it deals 4 damage to another target battle or opponent and one damage to up to one target creature. So sadly cannot deal four damage to a creature, but uh, still useful in finishing off battles or just going upstairs. And then hopefully the opponent has a one toughness creature or some other creature we can finish off with a one damage. And then if it does transform, we get Disciples of the Inferno, which is a 4-4 with prowess, saying if a non-creature source you control would deal damage to a creature, battle or opponent, it deals that much damage plus two instead. So the Disciples is incredibly powerful if we can get access to it. Especially nice if we can chain together multiple of this uh, battle, as we can now deal a ton of extra damage when it enters. But uh, yeah, in the right deck, maybe red-green, where we can pressure battles a little bit better. This could be a very powerful card indeed. So it gets a C. Next is Karsus Depth Guard, a 3-mana 4-3 Vaishina Warrior at common with Defender. And as long as the Depth Guard's power is 5 or greater, it can attack as though it didn't have Defender. 
So it does take a little bit of work to get this going, but uh, there's a few ways to do so. We can use the backup creatures to put a plus one counter on it. Can uh, maybe put an equipment on the depth guard, and we've seen a few cheap ones, especially in red, that can help enable it. So it's not too difficult to get it to five power, but without other synergies, it's going to be just uh, playing defense, which is probably not what we need in red. So it takes a bit of work, give it a C overall but can certainly overperform in the right build. And Marauding Dreadship is one of the few vehicles in the set. A 3 mana 4-1 at common, also has haste, crew cost is 2, and when it enters the battlefield we incubate 2. So if we have 5 mana total we could play the Dreadship and transform our incubator token into a Phyrexian to help crew the Dreadship and get in for 4. So that can be a lot of damage out of nowhere. But even if we just uh, play a 2-drop and then play the Dreadship on turn 3, we could already be attacking for 4. And then even if the opponent trades, we're still left with an Incubate token. So this strikes me like one of the better vehicles we've seen in recent memory. And this could also be a great way to tap the Dwarf that we've seen earlier, that lets you loot whenever it becomes tapped, to uh, keep the card advantage going, or card selection going, while uh, still crewing the Dreadship. So we'll give this a C+, I'm quite hopeful for this one. Then there's Nahiri's Warcrafting, 3 mana rare sorcery, dealing 5 damage to a creature, planeswalker or battle. And then we can also look at the top X cards of our library, where X is the excess damage dealt this way. We may exile one of those cards, put the rest on the bottom of our library in a random order, and then play the exiled card this turn. So yeah, if we take out something smaller, it can still provide a bit of extra card advantage. But even just using this to transform a battle could be worth it. So, a very solid removal spell, gets a B. Searing Barb is a 3 mana sorcery at common, dealing 2 damage to any target. If it's a creature, it cannot block this turn, and we get to incubate 1 as well. So, we'll be at its best in the sacrifice decks, where we don't mind sacrificing the incubate 1 token. And then uh, 2 damage could still help finish off something smaller, especially alongside other damage sources. So a playable card, but won't be able to take out the opponent's bombs necessarily, so just a C. Next is Voldaren Thrillseeker, a 3 mana 1-1 one, one rare vampire warrior with backup 2, so at the very least can be a 3-3 three, three by itself. And then for 1 mana, sacrifice this creature, and then it deals damage equal to its power to any target. So I guess the dream is to combine this with Yargle and Multani to hit the opponent for 20 damage. But uh, even outside of that combo, seems like a very solid card, quite flexible. If the opponent tries to take out our Thrill Seeker, we can still hopefully sacrifice it and uh, take something else out. So it's quite versatile and gets a B. Then there's Invasion of Kaldheim, a 4 mana rare battle. Four defense counters. This one's a bit strange. When it enters the battlefield, exile all cards from your hand and then draw that many cards. Until the end of your next turn, you may play cards exiled this way. So we essentially get to play the cards that were originally in our hand. So it does take a little bit of planning to time the invasion properly so that we can still cast all the cards from exile and then we get to reap the rewards from all the extra cards we've drawn in the meantime. So a bit finicky, but potentially quite powerful. And then once we defeat the four defense counters, we get Pyre of the World Tree, an enchantment, saying we can discard a land at any point to deal two damage to any target. And whenever we discard a land card, exile the top card of our library, and we may play that card this turn. So now all of a sudden, if we were to flood out, we can still discard lands to deal damage and basically replace those lands with additional cards from the top of our deck. So very powerful card if we can transform it. But uh, yeah, again, kind of finicky to set up, so requires a bit of uh, maneuvering to get the most out of it, but certainly powerful once we can line it up properly, gets a C+. Invasion of Karsus is a 4-mana rare battle. Four defense counters, and when it enters, it deals three damage to each creature and each planeswalker. So another sweeper. And then if it transforms, we get the Refraction Elemental, a 4-4 with Ward, making the opponent pay two life. And whenever we cast a spell, any spell, 
the elemental deals two damage to each opponent so yeah the elemental does not mess around once we get it and uh, yeah getting a sweeper can also be quite devastating if the opponent's got lots of smaller creatures out but uh kind of matchup dependent whether or not the opponent has mostly smaller creatures or maybe they're playing a green deck where three damage may not be enough still at the very least a b verging on a b plus almost a a rampaging raptor four mana four four dinosaur at rare has trample and haste for two and a red gets plus two plus so until end of turn and reminiscent of questing beast for sure because when it deals comma damage to an opponent it deals that much damage to target planeswalker that player controls or battle that player controls which is also probably the more relevant text in this limited format so a great way to both pressure the opponent's life total while still transforming your battles so yeah the raptor seems like a bomb even in the late game we can still pump it up and pair that with trample and haste and you've got yourself a very deadly dinosaur a red cap heal slasher has a four mana two three goblin rogue at common with a backup one and first strike so pretty simple but pretty effective as well giving another creature first strike to attack often means it can go unopposed and uh, heal slasher also seems quite good in multiples since first strike also tends to be even better when playing defense if you've got several first strike creatures back but uh, probably going to be played mostly in uh, red white backup aggro decks where giving first strike could let you keep attacking which is all you're interested in so it seems like a pretty solid role player gets a c plus next is scrappy bruiser four mana three four raccoon warrior at uncommon and when the bruiser attacks up to one target attacking creature gets plus two plus so and trample until end of turn okay that seems pretty powerful but then return that creature to its owner's hand at the end of combat that's potentially a drawback even though you can pick up your backup creatures to replay them you don't always want to be picking up your creatures again since that loses a lot of tempo and board presence so i'm a bit hesitant on the bruiser even though there will be scenarios where picking up your creatures is going to be beneficial also requires you to be attacking with your backup creatures and then they may not necessarily survive so i'm going to give this one a c stoke the flames is back and it was quite impactful when it was in standard last time a four mana uncommon instance with convoke dealing four damage to any target pretty straightforward but very effective can finish off some pretty large creatures but can also go upstairs or maybe finish off a battle to help transform it so this seems like a very important card in the set and gets a b or a brask is next a four mana four four legendary frex imperator at mythic with first strike and says whenever we cast an instant or sorcery spell or a brask deals one damage to target opponents and we get to add red mana to our mana pool making it easier to potentially chain together multiple instants and sorceries because for just a single mana we can transform or brask but only if we've cast three or more instant and or sorcery spells this turn so pretty tricky to set up but thanks to that extra red mana it may be feasible and then once transformed first it deals three damage to a target opponent and each creature they control it's a nice sweeper effect then we get to create three treasure tokens on the second chapter and then eventually until end of turn we may cast instant and sorcery spells from any graveyard if a spell cast this way would be put into a graveyard exile it instead and then transform it back into Orbrask definitely a bomb level card i don't think it's quite on the level of uh, shieldred or elish norn but uh, still realistic to transform and the front side of orobrask is also quite powerful as a 4-4 with first strike so it gets an a next is war trained slasher four mana four three wolverine dinosaur at common with menace and if the slasher attacks a battle double its power until end of turn so it can be hitting a battle for eight so yeah seems quite powerful especially in the red green battle deck gets a c plus for sure fearless scald is a five mana three two dwarf berserker at uncommon with backup one and double strike 
double strike one of the better keywords we can grant to another creature with backup. So hopefully we can target something else, get the immediate impact from a creature getting a plus one counter and double strike, and then we're still left with a 3-2 double strike, which isn't too bad either. So this one seems quite powerful as well, gets a B. Then Onake Javelineer is a 5 mana 5-4 five Ogre Spirit at common with the reach, can tap it to deal 2 damage to target player or battle. This one probably would have been better as a 4-5 as opposed to a 5-4, since its better use case is to play defense and then slowly ping away at the opponent or transform some battles, but uh, still seems quite solid as a 5 drop, happy to have it, gets a C+. And then there's the Remosian Greatsword, 5 mana uncommon equipment with Convoke, and then 2 mana to equip it, equipped creature gets plus 3 plus 1 and Trample. So Convoke always makes cards better, although this one's still 5 mana to play, so it's still quite steep even with Convoke, and then it's still an additional 2 mana to equip. So this one just feels a little bit too expensive to get online, even though the effect is desirable. I might see this being playable in like a blue rat spells deck, where we have lots of small tokens to help convoke it, and then giving a 1-1 one -one token plus 3 and trample could be significant, but uh, still seems a little bit too pricey to play and equip, so I'm gonna give it a D. And then we have Chandra, Hope's Beacon, another one of our Planeswalkers. Six mana, Mythic Rare Planeswalker, of course, five loyalty, and has a passive ability, saying whenever we cast an instant or sorcery spell, copy it, and we may choose new targets for the copy. Triggers only once each turn. Already the passive ability is incredibly powerful in the right deck. Then the minus X is probably where we're gonna start, dealing X damage to each of up to two targets. So this can eliminate two creatures at once, and then hopefully still have a Chandra left over. And then the plus two can add two mana in any combination of colors to help you ramp even more. And the plus one can also potentially provide card advantage to find additional instants and sorceries in the top five. So overall, an incredibly powerful Planeswalker can stabilize you the turn you play it, and then further pull you ahead if you manage to protect it. So it gets an S. Then a Furnace... Host Charger is part of the Land Cyclers at common, 6 mana for a 5-5 with haste, and Mountain Cycling for 2 mana, also Phyrexian, which could be relevant. Reminiscent of the Lava Serpent from Ikoria, uh, replacing Cycling 2 for Mountain Cycling 2, which is potentially an upgrade, even though, of course, there's no Cycling Synergies in this set. Still pretty solid common, happy to give it a C+. And then there's Shatter the Source, a 6 mana instant at common with Convoke. Can choose one between dealing 6 damage to a creature, planeswalker, or battle, or we can destroy an artifact. Hopefully, we're uh, choosing the first mode, but every now and then, I guess there might be a scary artifact we need to take out. But 6 damage is certainly significant, can transform a battle all by itself. Gonna be at its best in blue red, but I can see a lot of different decks wanting maybe one Shattered Source. That's kind of a top-end removal spell, so we'll give it a C+. And then there's Itali, Primal Conqueror, a 7-mana, seven 7-7 seven, seven legendary Elder Dinosaur at rare, has Trample, and when Itali enters the battlefield, each player exiles cards from the top of their library until they exile a non-land card. You may cast any number of spells from among the non-land cards exiled this way without paying their mana costs, so Itali doesn't even have to attack to generate value, and then we can transform a tally for a whopping 9 and a green Phyrexian mana. And then it turns into an 11-11 with Trample and Indestructible. And when a tally deals common damage to a player, they get that many poison counters. So they get an alternate win condition here by poisoning the opponent to death if they didn't die in the meantime. So yeah, a tally seems like a great bomb and gets an A for sure. And then there's Shivan Branch Burner, 7 mana, 4-4 four, four Dragon at Uncommon with Convoke, Flying and Haste. So a bit pricey, but of course Convoke makes it more realistic to cast. So if we can cast this around turn 5, get a 4-4 four, four with Haste and Flying, that's a great way to finish off battles as well, maybe out of nowhere that the opponent may not be expecting. So I'm a fan of the Branch Burner, give it a B. 
And then, last but not least, City on Fire. 8 mana, rare enchantment, also has Convoke, and says if a source we control would deal damage to a permanent or player, it deals triple that damage instead. So it's quite the commitment to cast City on Fire, probably have to tap most of our creatures to do so, but once it's in play, it's easily gonna dominate a game if we have some creatures that deal triple damage and maybe some bird spells as well. A bit pricey, but definitely impactful once we get it down, so I'll give it a B. First green card is Arachnoid's Adaptation, a 1 mana instant at common giving plus 2 plus 2 and reach until end of turn and can also untap that target creature. So very versatile comma trick if we're in the market for those, so I'll give those a C. Next is Placid Rotten Tail, 1 mana 1-1 one, one Fungus Rabbit at common with Vigilance. And for 2 and a green we can exile it from our graveyard to distribute 2 plus 1 plus 1 counters onto target creature, can only use that as a sorcery. So, not the most impressive stat starting out, but the ability out of the graveyard is nice. And uh, yeah, hopefully there's other synergies with the Rotten Tail, can maybe sacrifice it in your black-green decks. That's probably where this will be at its best, so I'll still give it a C. Then there's Seed of Hope, a 1-mana instant at common, mill 2 cards, and then we may put a permanent card from among the milled cards into our hands and gain 2 life. So just have to be careful not to play this in a deck with too many other instants and sorceries, but at the very least we can uh, put battles in our hand as well with it. And then uh, can also gain some life, which could be relevant, as we'll see later with the Multiverse Legends. There's a couple life gain synergies where this could also come in handy. So overall, playable card, give it a C. Atraxas Falls, quite versatile, 2 mana sorcery at common, can destroy target artifact, battle, enchantment or creature with flying. Now very important to note, if we destroy a battle, we're not transforming a battle. So this is probably going to be used to destroy a battle that the opponents played to begin with, so we uh, prevent them from transforming it, as opposed to helping us transform our own battles. But still quite versatile of course, can also take out flyers, artifacts or enchantments. So I'm probably happy to have at least one Atraxas fall in my green decks, so we'll give it a C. Next is Cosmic Hunger, 2 mana instant and uh, a common bite effect as it's known. A creature we control deals damage equal to its power to another target creature, and in this case also Planeswalker or Battle, so it gets a bit of added versatility there, and historically these effects get a B grade, and this one gets a B as well. Next is Deep Root Wayfinder, 2 mana, 2-3, two, rare Merfolk Scout. And when it deals common damage to a player or battle, we get to surveil one, and then we may return a land card from our graveyard to the battlefield tapped. So if we can play this early and connect, this could be a very nice way to ramp. But uh, yeah, the issue is going to be if we draw this later, or if we're on the draw and the opponent gets to play a 3-drop before we get a chance to attack with it, then it's going to struggle, and then it's just going to be a 2-mana two 2-3 two that doesn't have a very big impact on the game. So we'll give it a C+. Plus. Definitely above average for a 2-drop, but not particularly exciting. Then there's the Herbology Instructor, 2-mana, 1-3 uncommon, Tree Folk Druid. When it enters, it gain 3 life, and then for 6 and a black Phyrexian, we can transform it into the Malady Invoker, which is a 3-3 Phyrexian Tree Folk. When it transforms, target creature and opponent controls gets minus O minus X until end of turn, where X is the Invoker's power. So at the very least it's going to be minus 3 toughness, which could take out something significant. If we added more plus 1 counters, then it could get even better. So pretty solid 2-drop, gets a C+. Then there's Invasion of Ikoria, X and double green for a rare battle. Search our library and or graveyard for a non-human creature card with mana value X or less and put it onto the battlefield. And then uh, 6 defense counters, so not the easiest to transform. Although once we do, the payoff is certainly there. We get access to Zilortha, Apex of Ikoria, an 8-8 legendary dinosaur with reach, saying for each non-human creature we control, we may have that creature assign its damage as though it weren't blocked. So we'll certainly close out the game in a hurry, but the issue is 6 defense counters is pretty steep, and uh, as a tutor effect it's also not the most mana efficient necessarily. So a bit clunky. But uh, in a more dedicated deck that's good at taking out battles, I could see this being okay, so I'll give it a C. 
Then there's Invasion of Ixalan, 2 mana for a rarer battle. And when it enters, look at the top 5 cards of our library, reveal a permanent card from among them and put it into our hand. And the rest on the bottom in a random order. And then 4 defense counters, if we transform it we get access to the belligerent Regisaur 4-3 trampling dino, saying whenever we cast a spell the dino gets indestructible until end of turn. So this one's pretty low opportunity costs since for 2 mana it replaces itself and then it gives us a pretty realistic battle to potentially transform and get a nice dinosaur out of it. So I'll give it a C+. Iridescent Blade Masters, a 2 mana 2-2 two, two Elf Warrior at common and for 4 mana gets plus 2 plus 2 until end of turn. So I'm usually quite the fan of these 2 drops with a threat of activation. So even if we attack with this and we're not planning to pump it, the opponent still has to respect it getting plus 2 plus 2. So this will often be able to attack unopposed early on and then in the late game can still be a nice mana sink. So these usually play out quite nicely. So it gets a C+. Then there's Ozolith, the Shattered Spire. Ozolith is back and now is actually pretty good. A legendary artifact at rare, saying if one or more plus one counters would be put on an artifact or a creature we control, that many plus one counters are put on it instead. So similar to a hardened scales effect. And then for one and a green we can tap it to put a plus one plus one counter on an artifact or a creature we control. So essentially gets two counters thanks to its own ability. And then if it's not the right moment for Ozolith, we can also cycle it for two mana. So very powerful card if the game goes long and uh, gets a B. Then there's a Portent Tracker, two mana, one one Seder Scout that can tap to untap target land, which is a nice way of ramping. And then can also tap, choose target battle. And if an opponent protects it, we can remove a defense counter from it, otherwise put an extra defense counter on it. So another great way to finish off battles without actually attacking them or potentially help protect battles that the opponent played. So very versatile, a great 2-drop, gets a C+. Streetwise Negotiator, so 2 mana 0-2, Cat Citizen and Uncommon with a backup of 1. And this creature assigns comma damage equal to its toughness rather than its power. So we can also grant that ability to another creature using the backup mechanic. But even by itself, as a 2 mana 1-3 essentially, that deals 3 damage as opposed to 1, is quite nice. The only potential downside here is that if you're using a fight effect or a bite effect, it's not going to deal the extra damage since it's still looking at its power then, since it's only combat damage that deals damage equal to its toughness. But that's just a small side note. Still a pretty efficient card, gets a C+. Then there's a Vengeant Earth, a 2 mana instant at common, saying target creature or land we control becomes a 4-4 elemental creature with haste in addition to its other types until end of turn, and it must be blocked this turn if able. So the best case scenario is the opponent has a small creature back on defense that is quite valuable, and uh, using Vengeant Earth we can force him to block our 4-4 and take it out. Still requires kind of a bit of setup for that to line up properly. can also use this on defense because it's an instant to animate one of our lands and maybe set up an ambush. Still a bit awkward and there's definitely ways it can go wrong if the opponent has a combo trick or removal. So don't rate it particularly highly but if you're struggling and don't have access to a lot of removal this might be able to fill the gap. So this is like a low C, maybe C minus, high D. Wary Thespian is a 2 mana 3 1 cat druid at common, and when it enters a battlefield or dies, we get to surveil one. So that's a lot of extra card selection on top of a 2 mana 3 1, which is already serviceable. So this one's actually not bad, gets a C. Blighted Burgeoning, 3 mana enchantment aura at common, enchanting a land, and when it enters a battlefield, we get to incubate 2, and then the enchanted land can produce an extra mana of any color when it becomes tapped, so a nice way to ramp while still generating a 2-2 token eventually once we invest the mana into transforming it, so it gets a C. can also be a valuable way to fix our mana if we're trying to cast some of our multicolor rares or mythics. Same with a Kami of Whispered Hopes, 3 mana uncommon spirit, it's a 1-1 starting out, 
saying if one or more plus one counters would be put on a permanent we control, that many plus one counters are put on that permanent instead. So yet another hardened scales like ability. And then we can tap it, adding X mana of any one color, where X is the Kami's power. So the incentive is here to add extra counters to the Kami, so it can make even more mana. But even if we just use it as a mana creature that potentially gives us additional plus one counters, it's not too bad. So we'll give it a C+. Then there's Overgrown Pest, a 3 mana 2-2 two -two Pest at common. And then when the Pest enters the battlefield, we get to look at the top 5 cards of our library, and we may reveal a land or double-faced card from among them and put that card into our hands and the rest on the bottom. So at its best in a blue-green deck, which cares the most about transforming cards and probably has the highest density of those, but still being able to hit a land is not bad. So a nice 3 mana 2-2 two -two that provides a bit of card advantage, gets a C+. Then there's Polucranos Reborn, a 3 mana, 4 5, a legendary Hydra at rare. The drawback is that it's triple green, so it's going to be somewhat tricky to cast early outside of a mono green deck. But uh, yeah, realistically, even in a two color deck, we might be able to cast this around turn 5, turn 6. And then it's still a 4 5 with reach that we can transform for 6 and a white Phyrexian. And then it turns into a 6 6 Hydra with reach and the lifelink. And then when this creature dies, it splits up into two different 3-3 three, three Hydras. One of them has a lifelink, and the other one has reach. So a very nice card. Just a little bit awkward to cast in a lot of limited decks, so that's keeping it from being a bomb, but at the very least a B. Next is Sandstalker Moloch, which is the last of the hate cycle. This one's potentially still main deckable as a 3 mana 4 2 lizard at uncommon with flash. And when it enters the battlefield, if an opponent casts a blue and or black spell this turn, we get to look at the top 4 cards of our library, reveal a permanent card from among them, and put it into our hand. So, can provide a nice bit of card advantage in the right matchup. And even outside of that matchup, a 3 mana 4 2 with flash, assuming you're green as your primary color and the double green's not a problem still seems like a playable card that can maybe set up a nice ambush. So this one I'm actually giving a C, but gets of course even better as a sideboard option in the right matchup. Next is Serpent Blade Assailant, a 3 mana 2-1 Elf Warrior at common with backup 1 and death touch. Pretty simple, but uh, yeah, death touch for a turn means we'll potentially be able to get one attack in that we otherwise couldn't, and then a 2-1 death touch can stay back and play defense. Seems totally fine gets a C. Next is Tandem Takedown, 3 mana instant at uncommon, and says up to 2 target creatures we control each get plus 1 plus 0 until end of turn, and they each deal damage equal to their power to another target creature, Planeswalker or Battle. So Battle's the big one here, being able to potentially take out a battle for 3 mana is quite nice. So a great removal spell, and uh, yeah, not much more to say about it. We've seen effects like these before. This one being able to target battles as well makes it even better. So it gets a B. And next is Tribute to the World Tree, a triple green rare enchantment. So once again, the potential challenge here is casting this in a two-color deck. It says whenever a creature enters a battlefield under our control, draw a card if its power is three or greater. Otherwise, put two plus one plus one counters on it. So if we can cast this, it's incredibly powerful, as it's going to pull us ahead, as well as grow our creatures. But uh, similar to Polucranos, the challenge is the triple green. So I'm just going to give it a B, as opposed to potentially a higher grade if we could cast it reliably. Then there's a War Historian, 3 mana, 3-3 three, three Human Monk at common, with Reach. And it has Indestructible, as long as it attacked a battle this turn. Yeah, seems like a fine filler creature, nothing too special, gets a C. Then we've got another Planeswalker, Ren and Realmbreaker. 3 mana for a 4 loyalty Planeswalker at Mythic, has a passive ability similar to Chromatic Lantern fixing our mana, and then the plus 1 turns one of our lands into a 3-3 elemental creature with Vigilance, Hexproof and Haste until end of turn, and it's still a land, so it only lasts until end of turn but uh, could be a nice way to pressure the opponent or to play defense. Then the minus two can provide a bit of card advantage by milling three cards 
and then we may put a permanent card from among the milled cards into our hands and if we ever get to the minus seven which is pretty realistic if we play an early ren start plussing and protect it with additional creatures then we get an emblem saying we may play a land cards and cast spells from our graveyard which also seems pretty difficult for the opponent to overcome in a grindy matchup so ren and realm breaker are quite powerful uh, if we top deck it late in the game we're probably more interested in using the minus two ability for a bit of card advantage and then we may be able to use it twice so yeah overall seems quite powerful not quite on the level as uh, chandra that we've seen earlier but at the very least a b then there's a chomping kavu four mana for a common kavu a three three with backup one and then it has the ability this creature cannot be blocked by creatures with power two or less which is definitely an effect we've seen before and uh yeah this at the very least uh, four mana four four with that ability and then the backup gives us additional versatility to potentially target a different creature so it seems quite useful when trying to pressure uh, battles in our red green decks for instance as we can attack past smaller chum blockers so this one seems quite good gets a c plus then a converter beast is a four mana o1 phyrexian beast at common when it enters the battlefield incubate five so we'll require an extra investment to turn it into a five five creature but uh incubate five is large of course there's a potential drawback of the opponent being able to bounce our token and uh, getting rid of it but there's also potential synergies if we can flicker the converter beast we can make an extra incubate token so that's pretty neat not a bad card i uh, don't think it's quite on the level of uh, the kavu that we've just covered but at the very least a c still seems quite playable next is the crystal carapace a four mana enchantment aura at common giving plus three plus three and award two and we can also cycle it for two mana if it's not the right moment for it so yeah not the biggest fan of auras but this one seems quite impactful and also provides a bit of protection making it more difficult for the opponent to potentially kill our creature on curve they might have to wait an extra turn or two and in the meantime we can do quite a bit of damage so i can definitely recognize its power level still just a c but seems playable at least next is a doomscar warrior four mana for three human warrior at rare with a backup one and trample and the uh, backup ability will be quite useful here as well saying whenever this creature deals common damage to a player or battle we get to look at that many cards from the top of our library and then we may reveal a creature or land card from among them and put it into our hand so it can be a great source of card advantage and just pairing a, a plus one counter with trample could already be useful enough and uh, if we don't have any other creatures this is still a four mana five four at the very least with a nice ability if we can connect so a great card i was hesitant whether i would give this an a i landed on a b but it's definitely high b so b plus if i were handing those out next is fertilitz favor four mana instant at common and says target player searches their library for a basic land card puts it onto the battlefield tapped and shuffles and we also get to put two plus one plus one counters on up to one target artifact or creature so this being an instance is what makes it potentially quite powerful as we can not only set up an ambush but also a ramp at the same time so yeah i'm definitely looking forward to casting a few favors so i'm gonna give this a c plus and i'm hopeful that it's gonna deliver but i could see this ending up more in a c range instead then there's a glistening dawn four mana rare sorcery we can incubate x twice where x is the number of lands we control so let's assume we cast this on turn four then we get to incubate four twice so then on turn five we can have two four four creatures that are ready to attack but uh, in the late game this gets even better so should scale quite nicely as the game goes on even though it is a bit of a mana investment to enable both creatures still going to give it a b at the very least then there's the not fold hermit four mana four four troll at uncommon that can transform for five and a blue phyrexian mana so we could already transform it on turn five and then it turns into a five five chrome host hulk which when it attacks says up to one other target creature has base power and toughness five five until end of turn 
So now all of a sudden we can be attacking with 10 power and toughness out of nowhere. Yeah, this one seems quite powerful. Gets a B. Then there's Invasion of a Zendikar, 4 mana, Uncommon Battle, one of the first ones they revealed. When it enters the battlefield, we can search our library for up to two basic land cards and put them on the battlefield tapped. So a great way to ramp into our big green creatures. And then only three defense counters, so not too difficult to transform. And then we get the Awakened Skyclave, a 4-4 with Vigilance and Haste. Can tap to add one mana of any color. And as long as it's on the battlefield, it's also a land in addition to its other types. Yeah, this one also seems quite powerful. Gets a B. Then there's Storm the Seed Core, 4 mana, Uncommon Sorcery. Distribute 4 plus 1 plus 1 counters among up to 4 target creatures we control. And creatures we control gain Vigilance and Trample until end of turn. So kind of like a mini overrun effect, but it's permanent since it's plus 1 counters instead of simply plus 1 plus 1. So could be incredibly impactful at the right time. Trample can also help us finish off some battles. And if you compare this with the green-white battle that we covered earlier, I think this one compares favorably since you're probably more likely to only have two or three creatures in play, in which case this will generate even more plus one counters as well as giving Vigilance and Trample. So I think this one gets a C+. Then there's a Bonded Herd Beast, 5 mana, 4-5 Beast at common. And for 4 and the red Phyrexian mana, it transforms into a 7-5 with Menace. Still quite the investment to get to 7-5 with Menace. And uh, as a 5 mana 4-5, it's not particularly exciting. So it just gets a C. Then Invasion of Muraganda. Uh, Uncommon battle with six defense counters, and when it enters, put a plus one plus one counter on target creature you control. That creature fights up to one target creature we don't control. So I have definitely seen this effect in the past, typically as a four mana sorcery. So having to pay five mana is a little bit steep. And then when we do manage to transform it, we get the Primordial Plasm, a 4-4 four, four ooze, saying at the beginning of combat on our turn, Another target creature gets plus two plus two and loses all abilities until end of turn. So that's uh, kind of Moraganda's thing to pump up vanilla creatures. So yeah, this one's a bit overcosted. Reminds me of the black battle that deals three and gains three. Also a little bit overcosted. So I'll give this a C. Invasion of Chandelar is a five mana mythic rare battle, four defense counters, and when it enters the battlefield, return up to three target permanent cards from your graveyard to your hand. This will pair quite nicely with the various land cycling creatures, which we can cycle early, put in the graveyard, and then get back with our invasion, so we're ready to potentially hard cast them. And then only four defense counters, so pretty realistic to transform, giving us a ley line surge, an enchantment saying at the beginning of our upkeep we may put a permanent card from our hand onto the battlefield. So once again, perfect for putting those expensive land cyclers onto the battlefield. So this one has potential, definitely nice in the late game. Once there's a lot of cards in the graveyard as a nice 3 for one potentially. So we'll give this a B. And then there's a Ravenous Sailback, 5 mana, 3-4 Uncommon Dinosaur. When it enters the battlefield, we can choose one between gaining haste until end of turn or target artifact or enchantment gets destroyed. So nice to have a main deckable disenchant effect that gives us the added versatility of being a 3-4 creature. So I'm liking this quite a bit. Gets a C+. And then a Tangled Skyline as a 5 mana uncommon enchantment. When it enters we gain 5 life and incubate 5. And Phyrexians we control have reach, which is also a relevant upside. Green sometimes struggles with opposing flyers. And then a uh, gain 5 life buys us more time to pay the 2 mana to transform the 5-5 five five token. So yeah, I'm a fan of the skyline. Gets a B. Should be quite powerful in black-green especially, where we have more overlap with the Phyrexians. And then we get to Vorinclex, our final Praetor here. Uh, 5 mana, 6-6, six, six, legendary Phyrexian Praetor at Mythic with Trample and Reach. And when Vorinclex enters the battlefield, we get to search our library for up to two forest cards, reveal them, put them into our hand and shuffle. And then we just have to pay eight mana to transform Vorinclex. There's no additional requirements. 
So this one's one of the easier ones to transform, especially with Vorinclax. Searching up two lanes gets us on the way to eight mana. And then once we do, we get to mill 10 cards. A little bit risky and limited since we don't have a ton of cards left necessarily, but probably still worth it as we get to put up to two creature cards from among the milled cards onto the battlefield. Then on chapter two, distribute seven plus one plus one counters among any number of target creatures we control. And eventually, until end of turn, creatures we control can pay one mana to then fight target creature we don't control and then eventually transform back into Vorinclex. Yeah, this is another S. I think uh, Vorinclex deserves it. Not too difficult to transform, provides immediate value when it enters a battlefield and great stats on a five mana creature. Then we've got a Wildwood Escort, a five mana 3-3 three, three elf warrior at common. And when it enters the battlefield, we can return target creature or battle card from our graveyard to our hand. And if the escort would die, exile it instead, probably to prevent some uh, infinite loop shenanigans with escort getting back another escort. Still a very nice eternal witness like ability. So give this a C plus, a nice two for one in the late game. And also pairs quite nicely with the basic line cyclers like the Timberland Ancient 6 mana 6-5 Tree Folk at common with Reach and Trample and Forest Cycling for 2 mana. So incredibly versatile. If we're missing land drops early, just get a Forest and then late game, not a bad 6 drop. Give it a C+. Then there's the Ancient Imperiosaur, 7 mana for a rare dinosaur, a 6-6 six, six with Convoke, and has Trample and Ward 2. And the Imperiosaur enters the battlefield with two plus one plus one counters on it for each creature that convoked it. So if we tap, let's say, seven creatures, that's the dream, of course. Then we get a 2020 Trampler with Ward 2. But of course, more realistically, it's going to be somewhere in between. Still very powerful. Tap three creatures, get six additional plus one counters. We've got a 12-12 Trampler. That's probably the more realistic use case. Still seems quite good. Gets an A, seems like a bomb. And then there's a Copper Host Crusher, 8 mana, 8-8, eight, eight, Fraxin Bear Rhino at Uncommon with Trample and Hexproof. So nothing too exciting about it, unless we can somehow discard it and then reanimate it. Otherwise pretty expensive, 8 mana to get an 8-8, eight, eight, but it does have built-in protection, so if we can ramp into it, it could be a solid finisher. Still just a C, since it doesn't really have any fancy abilities and 8 mana is still quite expensive. First artifact is Urn of a Godfire, 1 mana artifact at common. Pay 2 mana to add 1 mana of any color, so kind of a bad way of fixing our mana. And then we can pay 6, tap and sacrifice the urn to destroy target creature or enchantment. Pretty expensive, but if you're short on removal, this might do the trick, so we'll still give it a C. And as we'll see later, there's a couple synergies among the uh, legendary multiverse creatures that could also synergize with Urn of Godfire. No spoilers. Then there's Flywheel Racer, a two mana vehicle, a 3 2 with Vigilance. Crew cost is only one, and then it can tap to add one mana of any color, but can only activate this if the racer is a creature. So it's a bit awkward. We have to first crew the racer before it makes mana. So that's a convoluted way of turning a creature into a mana creature. Not a fan. Requires a few too many steps. Give this a D. As a vehicle, it's also not particularly impressive. Then there's Kite Sail. Two mana equipments at common, giving plus one plus two and flying, and equips for two mana. So this might be another way of getting Yargle and Multani to connect with the opponent. And as we'll see with the Multiverse Legends, there's also the original Yargle that we can maybe pair with a Kite Sail. Not a high priority card, but especially in a green deck with some large creatures that lack evasion, this could be a way to finish off some battles. So we'll give this a C. And then there's Halo Hopper, 3 mana, 3-2 three, Frog with Convoke at common. Yeah, nothing fancy. Don't see myself playing this one very often. Gets a D. Realm Breaker, the Invasion Tree, is a 3 mana a legendary artifact at rare. Can pay 2 mana, tap it, and then a target opponent mills 3 cards. Put a land from the cards in the opponent's graveyard onto the battlefield under our control. And if this land would leave the battlefield, exile it instead. So this is 
an interesting way of both ramping and also maybe milling the opponent to death if you've got a very controlling build that could also work out and then we can pay 10 mana tap and sacrifice realm breaker to search our library for any number of praetor cards and put them on the battlefield so we can pretty much ignore the final ability but uh, just the first ability to mill the opponent for three and ramp at the same time could actually be pretty useful uh, just have to make sure you build your deck around this Maybe this will be good in a blue-black mill strategy, where you want to put at least 8 cards in the opponent's graveyard. Maybe you just have a very controlling deck with a lot of removal, and you can use Realm Breaker as your win condition to just mill the opponent out, who knows. But uh, yeah, it's got potential. I'm gonna give it a C+. And next is Scattering Surveyor. Scattering Surveyor is back, one of my favorite cards in Dominaria, and seems quite useful here as well as a 3-mana want to. When it enters, search your library for a basic land, reveal it, and put it into your hand. So, provides a nice 2-for-1 if the want to body is relevant, and there's plenty of sacrifice decks that don't mind having a creature to sacrifice. Getting a land is also useful, and then can also maybe fix your mana that way, and there's a few powerful 3-color mythics that we've seen, so... Yeah, happy to have Surveyor in pretty much every deck, and there's some decks where it's going to be even more useful with either the Sacrifice part or the mana fixing. So I'll give this a B, pretty high value, common, and uh, it's going to go pretty early in the draft, I think. Then there's Sword of Once and Future, finally completing the cycle of the uh, various swords. Three mana to play, two to equip, gives plus two, plus two, and protection from both blue and black. And then the abilities aren't the most exciting for limited at least. When our equipped creature deals damage to an opponent, we get to surveil two, and then we may cast an instant or sorcery spell with mana value two or less from our graveyard without paying its mana cost, and then exile it afterwards. Just not gonna have a ton of cards to get back from our own graveyard, so we're mostly looking at plus two plus two, protection, and then surveil two which is still good, especially if you're up against a blue-black deck, but uh, not quite as powerful as the red-green sword from Phyrexia, so this one just gets a B. Then there's Invasion of Ravnica, which is technically not an artifact, just a colorless battle, and we'll uh, start with four defense counters, and when it enters the battlefield, exile target a non-land permanent an opponent controls. That isn't exactly two colors. So we can get rid of three color cards, we can get rid of monocolored cards or even colorless cards. Just uh, cannot get rid of two color cards, which of course is kind of the signature of Ravnica. And then once transformed, so we get the Guild Pact Paragon, a 5-5 five -five artifact creature construct, saying whenever we cast a spell that's exactly two colors, look at the top six cards of our library, and then we can reveal another two color card and put it into our hand. So a very versatile battle, just because we can take it early and play it in pretty much every deck. And as a 5-mana removal spell, it's quite powerful. So we'll give this one a B. And then there's Fraxian Archivist, a 6-mana 4-5 artifact creature, Fraxian Construct, at common with reach. Can pay 2 mana, tap it, and then put target card from a graveyard on the bottom of its owner's library. So it could be effective against an opposing mill deck to prevent decking. Don't expect playing this one uh, very often, so we'll give this one a D. And then we get to the lands, and the only cycle of lands in this set are the uh, common tap lands that gain one life when they enter, and they all get a C plus grade, since these are great sources of mana fixing, especially if you're trying to play a three color deck, then you'll happily pick up some of these dual lands for mana fixing, and the life gain is a nice little perk. There might even be some life gain synergies, as we'll see in just a second, looking at the Multiverse Legends. These are about 65 creatures, all legendary creatures, from uh, past expansions, including some commander sets. So similar to the Mystical Archives and the Retro Artifacts, these cards will not be standard legal, but uh, will be legal in uh, older formats like Historic. But they will be, of course, playable in Limited, since every pack is going to have one of these extra legendary cards that you can draft, and uh, they're either uncommons, rares, or mythics, so no common bonus cards here. And uh, yeah, we'll kick things off with Anafenza, Kintree Spirit, 2 mana, 2-2 two, two legendary Spirit Soldier at rare. 
saying whenever another non-token creature enters a battlefield under your control, we get to bolster one, which means choose a creature with the least toughness among creatures we control and put a plus one plus one counter on it. So yeah, two mana, two, two, that will slowly grow our team. Seems pretty good. Gets a B. Next is Daxos. Can uh, gain us some life when creatures enter. Toughness grows with our devotion to white. Also pretty good. Gets a C plus. Of course, there's no life gain theme and there's not a huge focus on devotion, but still a solid two drop. Then we've got SRAM, Senior Edificer. Sadly, there's not a very big aura or equipment or vehicle theme in Limited, so it's not going to draw us a ton of cards, but still a solid two drop and hopefully you've got a few equipment to draw cards with. So it gets a C+. Thalia is also back here, 2 1 first strike taxing non creature spells. So, especially in a red white aggro deck with a lot of backup creatures, this might be affecting the opponent a lot more if you mostly have creatures in the deck. So, that's where it's going to be at its best. Gets a C. Quende is back, 4 mana 2 2 with double strike, saying creatures you control with first strike have double strike. There's not a ton of first strike creatures in the set to begin with. I've seen a couple in red and white. So that's where Quende is going to be at its best. Gets a C+, still a 2-2 double strike. Then there's Kenrith, the Returned King, and this is certainly a bomb. Even if you're not playing a 5-color deck, just being able to use the white ability to gain 5 life for 3 mana, and then its various other abilities to distribute plus 1 counters, draw cards, or even reanimate creatures, are all incredibly powerful on a 5-mana five 5-5. Five five. So this is easily a bomb, gets an A. And then Elish Norn, Grand Cenobites is back. 7 mana, 4, 7, Mythic Rare, Praetor. So I lied when we said we covered the last Praetor, since there's quite a few Praetors in the bonus sheet. A 4, 7 with Vigilance, giving creatures we control plus 2, plus 2, while giving creatures the opponent's controls minus 2, minus 2. So this can often decimate the opponent's board as soon as we play it. Even if the opponent has an answer at the ready, they're still going to lose all their 2 toughness creatures. And uh, if this sticks around, it's going to be impossible for the opponent to win on the battlefield. So this is another S-tier level card, in my opinion. Then we've got Baral, Chief of Compliance. 2 mana, 1, 3, discounting instants and sorceries. And if we can counter stuff, we also get to draw and discard. There's not a ton of counter spells, but discounting instants and sorceries will still be quite useful, especially in your blue-red Convoke decks. So it gets a C+. Got Tetsuko, 1-3, uh, making creatures we control with power or toughness, one or less unblockable. Can be quite useful as well in the right deck. Gets a C+. We've got Emery, Lurker of the Loch, and this is probably the creature that has become the weakest compared to the original set where it was printed. In uh, the original Eldraine we had quite a few artifacts to get back with Emery. This time around the best we can do is probably getting back the urn that we covered that can be sacrificed for 6 mana to destroy something else. Outside of the urn there's just not a ton of artifacts to get back with Emery, so this one gets a D. Inga Rune Eyes can scry 3 when it enters and if a lot of creatures die potentially draw 3 as well. Gets a C+, fine filler. Got Jingataxius Core Augur, the 10 mana 5 4 Praetor with Flash, saying at the beginning of our end step, draw 7 cards, and each opponent's maximum hand size is reduced by 7. These abilities are very powerful, especially in Constructed. In Limited, drawing 7 every turn could actually turn into a drawback pretty quickly, as you risk decking if you cannot close out the game in time. And then, of course, 10 mana is very expensive, so unless we can cheat it and play, by somehow discarding it and reanimating it, which also isn't going to be trivial to set up. Uh, I'm not a huge fan of this. Give it a D, but uh, definitely a fun card for Constructed. Then there's Timurets, another demigod, 2 mana, 2 power, toughness equal to our devotion to black, and can also exile cards from graveyards, gaining a life if we exile creature cards. Gets a C+. Ayara, also definitely not as good as in Eldraine, as a 2-3, whenever Ayara or another black creature enters a battlefield under our control, each opponent loses one and we gain one life, can tap, sacrifice another black creature to draw a card. The problem here is that a lot of creatures in the sacrifice decks are going to be artifact creatures, the various incubate Phyrexians, which are not black, so they don't drain with Ayara, 
and we can also no longer sacrifice them using Ayara's ability. So Ayara fell down to a C, also triple black, not the easiest to cast. Then we've got Horobi, Death's Whale, 4 mana, 4-4, four, four, Legendary Spirit at Rare with Flying, saying whenever a creature becomes the target of a spell or ability, destroy that creature. This is symmetrical, so the risk is we play Horobi, the opponent has a random pump spell, or worst case scenario, a creature that has an ability that targets, and all of a sudden they can kill Horobi or maybe some other creatures in the process. That would be pretty bad. Best case scenario, we play Horobi and have several ways of targeting opposing creatures to try and decimate the opponent's board. So it's definitely a double-edged sword and requires to build around it. If no one has any way of targeting, then a 4-4 flyer for 4 also isn't too bad. So I'll give it a C. Definitely a dangerous card to play, but in the right deck could be quite powerful. Then there's Saison. Perverter of Truth, a 5-mana 6-5 legendary demon spirit at rare, saying at the beginning of each player's upkeep that player loses 2 life and draws 2 cards. So the problem with Saison is that the opponent's going to be the first one to draw 2 extra cards, and if they have a removal spell for Saison, they answer it, and then they're up a bunch of cards in the process, which I'm not a fan of. So this one sadly gets a D, despite being a pretty cool card. Then we've got another way of Poisoning the opponent to death with the Blight Dragon 5 mana 4-4, four, four, Mythic Rare, so you're not going to encounter it very often, but it has Flying and Infect, meaning it deals damage to the opponent in the form of Poison Counters. So if it hits the opponent for 4, it applies 4 Poison Counters, and it only takes 10 of those to win the game. And then we can also pay an extra Black mana to give it Haste until end of turn, so 6 mana to get in for 4 right away and also double black to regenerate, which is not an ability that's uh, very common these days. They've kind of uh, phased it out over time, but to regenerate means if we play double black, the blind dragon essentially gets this regeneration shield, which means if our creature is about to be destroyed, then instead it's tapped, removed from combat as well, and then remove the regeneration shield from it. So that's a way to keep our creature alive through removal spells basically. So if we can keep up the extra mana, that's probably a good idea. Still doesn't help against Exile or ways that can decrease toughness, so those can still get around the regeneration. So it gets an A, definitely a bomb, just takes three attacks to win the game. Then there's a Yargle, a Glutton of Urborg, five mana, nine, three at Uncommon. So this one needs a little bit of help to hit the opponent. So as we've said, there's the Kite Sail to give it flying, Maybe we can give it Trample or Flying some other way through the various backup creatures. So that's what we're looking at, otherwise sadly just a D. Then Shieldred Whispering One is another S-tier level Praetor, a 6-6 uh, six, six with Swamp Walk. So if the opponent controls a Swamp, they can no longer block Shieldred. At the beginning of our upkeep, we can return a creature from our graveyard to the battlefield. At the beginning of the opponent's upkeep, they have to sacrifice a creature. So even if the opponent has the perfect answer at the ready, usually they'll have to at least untap and lose one of their creatures in the process. If they don't have an immediate answer to shield it, it's gonna take over the game in just one or two turns. A Ragavan, also one of the multiverse legends, one mana, two one, legendary monkey pirate. And if it deals common damage to a player, we get to create a treasure token and exile the top card of that player's library. Until end of turn, we may cast that card. So it does say cast, which means we cannot play lands from the opponent that we exiled. can also dash Ragavan for one and a red, meaning it will enter the battlefield with haste, and then end of turn we have to pick it back up into our hand. So probably the best one mana play that's available in this limited format. And yeah, if we can connect with it a few times early on, it generates a huge mana advantage, potentially card advantage as well. But uh, if you don't have removal to back it up or other ways to give it evasion, then the opponent's going to be able to block it pretty quickly. So not quite as broken as it will be in Constructed, where it's more realistic to keep attacking with Ragavan, but uh, still definitely a very powerful card and limited, and at the very least a B. Just uh, becomes a lot weaker if you don't have it in your opening hand. Then there's Captain Lannery Storm, 2 and a red for a 2-2 legendary human pirate with haste, and when Lannery attacks we get to create a treasure token, 
And then whenever we sacrifice a treasure at any point, Lannery gets plus one plus zero until end of turn. So if we can play Lannery especially early on in the game, if the opponent doesn't have any great blockers lined up, this can also generate a huge mana advantage, similar to Ragavan. And then being able to sacrifice treasures at any point to pump up Lannery's power means it can still attack into larger creatures potentially. Especially nice if we can then use that treasure mana to cast some instants as well. So yeah, I was debating whether or not Lannery deserved to get an A. Still ended up on a, a B. But playing Lannery especially if you're on the play and get to run it out on turn 3, it feels like one of the best cards you can possibly play on turn 3. Next up is Squee, the immortal 3-mana 2-1 legendary goblin, and we may cast Squee from our graveyard or from exile. So this is perfect in a sacrifice deck where we can keep getting Squee back over and over, and will be a very nice mana sink. So it gets a B as well, very annoying creature to get past for some decks. Valduk, Keeper of the Flame, is back as well, 3-mana three 3-2 three uncommon, and at the beginning of combat on our turn, for each aura and equipment attached to Valduk, we get to make a hasty 3-1 elemental token with Trample, and then exile that token at the beginning of the next end step. So Valduk rewards us for equipment and auras, which isn't really a very supported theme in Limited. We have seen a couple decent equipment in red and white especially, so there are ways to make Valduk work. Question is whether that's going to be worth building around. And I'm somewhat hesitant, so I'm just going to give Valduk a C, whereas I think I would rate it more highly in a different limited environment. And then same goes with Zada, Hedron Grinder, a 4-mana 3-3 three, three at Uncommon. So this was downshifted from a rare. It says whenever we cast an instant or sorcery spell that targets only Zada, then copy that spell for each other creature we control. Each copy targets a different one of those creatures. So best case scenario, we have a couple creatures out, and then we play a pump spell that also lets us draw a card, and then all of a sudden we can draw a card for each creature we control while pumping the team. There were a lot of those cards in the set where Zada was originally printed, not so much in this limited environment, even though you can find a few examples, like the blue transformation card, turning your creature into a 4-3 and drawing a card. That's the type of effect that shines alongside Zada and of course other pump spells. But uh, yeah, there's not too many of those, so I'm hesitant to give Zada a very high rating. But if you maybe pick up one or two Zadas early on, you can try and build around it more, and then it could be quite powerful indeed. So we'll give Zada C. Then we've got Urbrask the Hidden returning as well, 5 mana 4-4, four, four, has haste as do all our other creatures and opposing creatures enter the battlefield tapped. So this is quite the beating if we can curve into it and the opponent isn't ready then all of a sudden they'll be on the back foot and yeah we'll give Urabrask an A. I think this is quite powerful especially good at uh, helping you finish off battles which is also going to be quite common. Finn the Fangbearer is back, 2 mana 1 3 with Death Touch, that can try to poison the opponent to death if we can hit them with our Death Touch creatures. There's not that many Death Touch creatures in the set, sadly, so Finn not quite as powerful as it used to be. Just gonna give it a C here. A Goreclaw, 4 mana 4 3, giving creature spells with power 4 or greater a 2 mana discount. And then whenever Goreclaw attacks, each creature we control with power 4 or greater gets plus 1 plus 1 and trample until end of turn. And yeah, in a green deck with lots of beefy creatures, the discount will quickly add up. So easily at least a B. I was also hesitant whether to give it a higher grade would be a B plus if we were handing those out. Renata called to the hunt for mana with power equal to our devotion to green, which will be at the very least 2 with Renata, but hopefully even more. And then a 3 toughness, and then each other creature we control enters a battlefield with an additional plus 1 plus 1 counter on it, which is also a supported archetype in limiteds in green-white. We've got a few more plus 1 counter synergies, so Renata actually slots in very nicely, and even better than some of the other demigods. This one gets a B. Next is Yodora, Grave Gardener, 5 mana, 5-5, five, five, a legendary tree folk druid at rare. And whenever another non-token creature we control dies, we may return it to the battlefield face down under its owner's control, and it's also a forest. 
Yeah, pretty interesting card. 5 mana, 5-5 five, five, with a bit of upside, turning our dead creatures into lands. Definitely a bit of a marginal upside, but uh, yeah, give it a C+. Next is a Vorinclex, a Voice of Hunger. The 8 mana, a Legendary Praetor, has Trample. Says whenever we tap a land for mana, add 1 mana of any type that land produced, so it doubles our mana essentially. And it also makes it so the opponent cannot untap some of their lands, because whenever an opponent taps a land for mana, that land doesn't untap during its controller's next untap step. Very annoying for the opponent to deal with. 8 mana is quite pricey, admittedly, but it's still realistic to cast, especially in green where we have a bit of ramp. And then a 7-6 trampler can also end the game pretty quickly. So this one still feels quite powerful, but uh, yeah, 8 mana is still kind of on the expensive side. So I don't think it's quite as powerful as some of the other Praetors. So I'm going to land on a C for Vorinclex. But uh, yeah, I could see this being a little bit better in some more dedicated ramp decks. Then there's Wrath, Weatherlight, Stalwart. 2 mana, 1, 3, a legendary human wizard at uncommon. Saying whenever we cast an instant or sorcery spell, we may tap 2 untapped creatures we control. If we do, draw a card. And then 5 mana to give creatures we control plus 1 plus 1 and vigilance until end of turn. This used to be a lot more powerful in the original Dominaria United, but uh, nowadays a lot of the non-creature spells are battles, which don't work with Wrath. So it kind of takes a little bit of a hit here, and as a result ends up as a C+, as opposed to a higher grade, which I gave in Dominaria United. Then a Taigam Ojutai Master, another commander card I believe. 4 mana, 3-4 legendary human monk at rare. Says instant sorcery and dragon spells we control cannot be countered. And whenever we cast an instant or sorcery spell from our hand, if Taigam attacked this turn, that spell gains a rebound. So we can replay it an extra time in our next turn basically. So I think the idea with Taigam is you want to attack with it and then... Potentially before blockers even, you could cast, let's say, an instant speed bound spell or some other tempo card that affects the board. And then we can make it so Taigam doesn't die in the middle of combat. And then we get to rebound and we can potentially keep that train going. So yeah, pretty interesting build around card. Gets a C+. Then the companions are back as well including Yorion, which is one of the easier cards to potentially include in limiteds. Just make sure you have enough playables and then play a, a bigger deck. 60 cards is going to be necessary. So yeah, still realistic to play in limiteds. And then it is quite powerful getting access to a 4-5 flyer that can potentially re-enable your enter the battlefield abilities. It gets an A. Then Atris, Oracle of Half-Truths, is back. 4 mana, 3-2 with Menace. That plays a fun mini-game, providing card advantage when it enters. Gets a B. We've got Arona. This one actually ended up being kind of disappointing in Dominaria United. So it just gets a C. Grimgrin, Corpse Born, is one of the trickier cards to evaluate. A 5 mana, 5-5 five five legendary zombie warrior at Mythic. It enters the battlefield tapped and doesn't untap during your untap step. So how do we untap Grimgrin? Well, we sacrifice another creature, untap it and put a plus one counter on it. And whenever Grimgrin attacks, destroy target creature defending player controls and then put an extra plus one counter on Grimgrin. So it does take a little bit of work to get it going, but assuming you're like a sacrifice deck with lots of small creatures you don't mind sacrificing, Grimgrin will certainly decimate the opponent's board. And then you can also always keep it untapped if you've got a creature to sacrifice. So it can play defense nicely. So I think this card's powerful, but does require you to build around it somewhat. So I'm going to give it a C+. Then Giruda, another companion that's one of the more powerful ones. Just need to draft all evenly costed cards to play this as your companion. And then this can be a nice 6-6 six, six that can potentially find another creature when it enters a battlefield. So we'll give this one an A as well. 2 mana, 1-1 one, one legendary human shaman at uncommon. And whenever we sacrifice any permanence, we can put a plus 1 plus 1 counter on Yuri. And when Yuri dies, it deals damage equal to its power to any target. So this will play quite nicely in the red-black sacrifice decks. Gets a C, still pretty narrow outside of it. And then Kroxai is back. 
the Elder Giants that can make the opponent discard, and we can escape for four mana, exiling five other cards from our graveyard. Potentially gets even better in this set when the opponent's potentially milling us. There's a few blue and black cards that uh, could facilitate the escape. So yeah, powerful card, gets an A. We'll quickly take over once escaped. Then Judith is back as well, 3 mana, 2-2, two, two, giving other creatures we control 1 extra power, and whenever a non-token creature we control dies, Judith deals 1 damage to any target. So especially powerful in the red-black sacrifice decks, where we might be sacrificing creatures anyways to now deal 1 extra damage. So this is incredibly powerful in an aggressive red-black deck. Now of course the context is a little bit different from this set where it was originally printed, since Rakdos was kind of the default option in that limited format as one of the aggressive decks, which could be very nice. There were plenty of 1 and 2 drops to play with. Definitely fewer 1 and 2 drops in this set, so Judith gets a little bit weaker because of that, but I think it's still at least uh, an A-level card. It's gonna pump up our team, and if creatures die we still get to deal a ton of damage. And then we've got a bush as another companion, 5 mana, 3-5 legendary, that wants us to draft oddly costed cards, so 1, 3, 5, 7. This one's maybe a bit more challenging than Giruda, since there's typically more 2 drops than 1 drops, etc. But still quite realistic to have this as your companion, and then it will double your damage from those sources, so also quite the payoff. So we'll give this an A as well. Then Randa, Coalition Warlord, is back as well. This one feels a bit out of place, since we no longer have all the dual lands with all the basic land types to enable domain, so this one feels kind of weak, and I'm gonna give a D. And then Gigantha, also one of the companions. This one's also pretty easy to play as your companion, just avoid double uh, colors in your casting costs, and then you're good to go. Although the payoff here may be not quite as exciting as some of the other companions, just a 5-5. Although it can also be nice in maybe a 5-color deck if you're going for that challenge of casting some of the 4- and 5-color cards. Then Gigantha could fix your mana, so I'll give this one a B. Next is Shanna, Cisse's Legacy, 2 mana with power and toughness equal to the number of creatures we control, and gets uh, protection as well because the opponent cannot target it with abilities. They can of course still target it with typical removal spells, but uh, yeah, a bit of built-in protection never hurts. Still not the uh, most exciting creature, gets a C. Then Kahira, also one of the companions. Now of course sadly there's not a ton of cats, elementals, nightmares, dinosaurs or beasts in this set, so this one loses a lot of value because of that. So sadly has been demoted to a D, where it was a pretty fun challenge to have it as your companion in Ikoria, just not going to be the same here, sadly. And then we've got the Bounteous Dawn, a 4-mana 2-2 two -two legendary unicorn at rare with a lifelink, saying at the beginning of each end step, if we gained life this turn, distribute that many plus one plus one counters among any number of other target creatures. So... Pretty interesting build around. Um, there are the gain lands in the sets which can help, and if we can give this some sort of evasion, whether it's flying or there's other backup creatures that can maybe help get this through so we can gain life, that can also help. And uh, finally there's the green one mana uh, spell that also gains two life. Those are all potential ways to incidentally gain some life to enable this. We've seen the battle that gains for life. So those are the types of cards you want to try and pick up if you want to draft around this. The payoff isn't amazing, but I think it's still potentially playable in the right deck. So we'll give it a C. Also works with plus one plus one counters, and there's a few of those synergies going around. Then Lurus, another one of the companions. One of the few places you can still play Lurus is in Limited. And uh, yeah, this one's quite powerful, getting back your cheap cards from the graveyard. You can still play more expensive non-permanent cards, like your various removal spells, and uh, will play quite well in your sacrifice decks as well, as long as you keep the curve low. You can also main deck this without having it as companion, so this one gets an A as well. Now Taisa, I wasn't too impressed with once I looked at the entire set says if a creature dying causes a triggered ability to trigger, that triggers an additional time, 
and creature tokens we control have Vigilance and Lifelink, so there's not too many death triggers in the set. There are quite a few tokens, mainly the Phyrexians, once we incubate them, so that's the main synergy with Taisa, otherwise I wasn't too impressed, so it just gets a C. Then the Judge of Valor, on the other hand, still seems quite good. 5 mana, 2 for Flying Lifelink. If we cast our second spell, it can provide a bit of card advantage. So this one gets a B. And then Agar also missing his giant friends to synergize with. Not too many wizards either. So we're mainly looking at burn spells to deal excess damage and draw card. So this one also has been demoted to a C. Lutri, still pretty easy to play as companion, just avoids two of the same card. And then, uh, yeah, should be a nice way to double up on some of our spells. Gets a B, not quite on the same level as, let's say, a Lurus or some of the other companions, but still quite powerful. This is another commander card. The Telcor Engineer is a 6-mana 4-4, saying creature tokens we control have haste. And at the beginning of combat on our turn, create a 2-1 blue Phyrexian Mirror Artifact Creature Token. And then we may choose a token we control. If we do, each other token we control becomes a copy of that token. So at the end of the day, we're just making a 2-1 token every turn, which is pretty neat. And uh, yeah, for 6 mana, that seems like a pretty solid card. Gets a B. Dina is back as well, but we're missing all the pest tokens to really synergize with it. Not as many life gain synergies nowadays. So Dina also dropped in value significantly, down to just a C. Umori, another companion that's pretty easy to have as your companion, as long as you only draft creatures. Uh, also not quite as exciting as some of the other companions, but still going to give it a B. And then the Master Smith, another card that cares about equipment or uh, auras potentially. So once again, not too many equipment or aura synergies throughout the set. So not too excited about the Master Smith. Gets a C. But maybe you can draft a Master Smith Valduk deck with all the equipment and make it work. Zerda also back. Now there's not enough creatures to realistically have this as your companion since before we had the cycling creatures that you could have alongside Zerda's companion. Now, Zerda is still potentially a card you can main deck in some creature decks, since it can discount the activated abilities, which also includes the various um, incubate cards. So that's an interesting synergy. And then we can also prevent a creature from blocking, which can be nice. So yeah, Zerda gets a C+, I think a fine creature to main deck in a deck with plenty of incubate. And then Aurelia, another S tier level card in my opinion. 6 mana, 3, 4, Flying Vigilance, Haste, and lets us attack a second time with all our creatures, including Aurelia. So this will help play offense and defense nicely, and if we're already ahead on board, this will be the final nail. Firesong and Sunspeaker, on the other hand, don't have a ton of support in the set, just because we need a lot of life gain, which uh, we're kind of lacking here, and... Uh, Otherwise can still maybe turn some of our burn spells into a spell that also gains life, which is nice, I guess. But a 6 mana, 4, 6, not too impressive. So it gets a C. And then another commander card, the Slumbering Isle. 4 mana, 12, 12. Enters the battlefield with 5 slumber counters on it, and it's also tapped. As long as it has a slumber counter on it, it's a land. And then it can also tap to make blue and green. Whenever we cast a spell, we may remove a slumber counter from the slumbering isle. So early on it can just make a nice bit of mana, and then later in the game turns into a 12-12 once we've cast 5 spells. So it seems like what blue-green is interested in, the extra mana will also come in handy. So we'll give this a B. Azuri Claw of Progress is not the same Azuri from uh, the Phyrexia expansion. This is uh, a 4 mana, 3-3. Three, three says whenever a creature with power 2 or less enters a battlefield under our control, we get an experience counter. And at the beginning of combat on our turn, put X plus 1 plus 1 counters on another target creature we control, where X is the number of experience counters we have. So this one's a bit complicated, but the general gist is we want to play lots of cheap creatures, maybe even tokens, that can uh, get extra experience counters with Azuri. And as the game goes on, we can potentially get a ton of plus one plus one counters. 
So this card has potential, even though it does take a while to get going. Still landed on a B for Azuri. And then Emoti, Celebrant of Bounty, 5 mana, Legendary Naga Druid at Uncommon with Cascade. It's a 3-1, can be a bit hard to decipher. Uh, so Cascade means we exile cards from the top of our library until we hit a non-land card with mana value, in this case 4 or less, and then we get to cast a spell for free. And then all spells we cast with mana value 6 or greater have Cascade. So that can provide a ton of extra card advantage in our blue-green ramp deck. So this card seems pretty fun. Gave it a C+. And then Keruga, another one of the companions, wanting us to have all expensive cards in our deck. Also pretty powerful, but does require us to give up on all our 2-drops, which can be quite the drawback as well. So gave this one a B. And then Yarok the Desecrated is back, and this one should be quite fun as well in this set, since if I'm not mistaken it also doubles the triggers from our uh, battles entering the battlefield, in addition to all other creatures as well. And then a 3-5 Death Touch lifelink that uh, doubles our various triggers seems quite nice. So I gave this an A. Atraxa Praetor's Voice is the smaller version of the Atraxa we're more familiar with. So 4 mana, 4-4, four, four, still has Flying Vigilance, Death Touch, and Lifelink. And at the beginning of our end step, we get to proliferate. So yeah, there's quite a few plus one counters floating around that we can maybe proliferate between our incubate tokens and the backup mechanic. The challenge is going to be getting those four different colors in play. So by the time we have all four colors, we're probably past turn four. But Atraxa still seems quite powerful, so I'm willing to give it a C plus at least and then the decks that are capable of casting it, they're going to be very happy to have it. And then niv Reborn, last but not least, 5 mana, one of each color, for a 6-6 six, six flyer, and when it enters the battlefield it digs for all the 2 color cards among the top 10 cards of our library, and then for each different color pair we can put one of those into our hand. So yeah, if we're going for the Gigantha as companion challenge, then niv could be a fine addition to that deck, and then try and draft as many multicolor cards as possible. We'll need plenty of mana fixing, so make sure you pick up your Skittering Surveyors. Uh, so yeah, will be a fun challenge. Wouldn't recommend it if it's your first draft, but uh, if you're getting a bit bored with the set, the Multiverse Legends will certainly spice things up. So give niv a C. Alright, so that will wrap things up for this set review. As another reminder, if you want a quick overview of all my card ratings for both this expansion as well as all previous expansions on Magic Arena, make sure to become a Patreon supporter or Twitch subscriber, and then I'll make sure to keep the ratings up to date as the set develops. But for now, I want to thank you for watching, hope you enjoyed, and as always, have a nice day! I also want to thank all my patrons for being part of the channel, and you can become a patron yourself today and decide the topic of future videos over at patreon.com forward slash legendvd.